There were two loves in his life. His engine and... Cut to picture a blank check podcast artwork. Oh, great. Perfect. There you go. You're saying we're like a... Uh, a, a sweetheart. A, a sweet lady. A little sweetheart and a little framed picture. Absolutely, Griffin. Thank yes. you for that. Uh, what do I, you do when you're looking for the quote there? There are quote like pages Like on IMDb, these. there's like the, 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 the title cards. Right. The, yes. Okay. Right. Um... I, I I'm still I want I want a fucking tagline for one of these. This is what I was searching for. I was like, this this must have had a tagline, but I can't find one. I, I when it's a fair question. Like I, I do uh, feel like movie taglines have always existed. Oh like, okay okay okay. Here I here's one, but some of these it says like trade paper ad. Here's the one that's that seems to be okay. semi legit. The tale of a lad, a lass, and a locomotive. That's a fine yeah, that sounds good. Right. And then there's another one that is love, locomotives, and laughs. That's what I'm looking for. But then a lot of them are like, what they list as taglines are like, his first United Artist picture. <laughs> right. That's that's not really going to, you know, make I mean, me run to the theater. No. I just thought of one. Go what? On. The South will ride again. Well, <laughs> truly. <laughs> That is kind of <laughs> the pitch for this movie. Oh, boy. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Blank Check with Griffin and David. I'm Griffin. I'm David. No giggling, David. This is a very serious episode. Can't giggle. Dead ever. serious. Certainly not when talking about Buster Dead Keaton. pan. We need flat pans right. and no laughs, right, no breaking. Old, uh, stone faces. Yes. yes. Uh, we're going to talk separately and not giggle mm -hmm. uh, out of respect to the great Buster Keaton. Uh, Blank Check with Griffin and David. Griffin and David. Griffin and Data. Good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> this is Blank Check with Griffin and Data. Like Me and a Star golden Trek? skin android. Yeah, that'd yes. be fun. Uh, it's a podcast about filmographies. Directors who have massive success early on in their careers are given a series blank checks to make whatever crazy passion projects they want. And sometimes those checks clear and sometimes they bounce. Baby, today we're talking about what is his ultimate blank check and what was basically an, an entire blank check career. This whole run we're talking about is... A blank check, blank check. Run. This is maybe his most ambitious project. And his biggest bounce at the time. That has then become his most critically sort of uh, respected yes, I, film. Yes. But also challenged in ways we will yes, talk about. Yes, but this was his, this is, this was in the top 10 of the sight and sound poll for, for Forever. multiple times. Forever. Like this was. Yeah, for many, multiple decades. The unanimous, or whatever. This was yes, the. This um, became the, the critical consensus. Best buster. Masterpiece. Right. Yes. And I think was kind of. Key. Partly because it's long and partly because it has like a real story, I think. Is yeah. Part of it. yeah. And, and it's, it, look, it is, uh, it is stunningly well directed. Yes. I mean, it looks it looks great. It and looks it so good. It looks so good. And the the stunt work is still incredibly impressive. That's the other thing. I think a lot of, you know, there's sort of the like, somewhere in the 60s and 70s, there's sort of this critical reevaluation where people start going like, actually, I think Buster Keaton's the good one. When Chaplin had remained really large in the culture. And I think this was one of the movies that people were holding up as like, look at this through a modern lens. And most of looking at it through a modern lens was... Oh, he kind of made the first proper action comedy. Right. And it plays in a modern way in that sense, in a genre that continues to be humongous. It moves. It moves. This thing's moving. And just the balance of like story beats, we're, action beats, comedy beats, all that sort of stuff. We are talking about two movies today, of course, but the right. movie we're referring to right now is The General. The General. Uh, and then we're also talking about Battling Bl Butler, which is just one of his movies. And I don't say that derisively, but it comes from the opposite side of Buster Keaton's personality, which is just let's find a really simple hook for a picture versus the general is like all of his ambition. Yes. Um, I do think he, he, he thought very highly of battling Butler. We'll get into yeah. it, I think, but I think no, he, no. because it was a hit, I, I think he was just derisively. very pro his movies that succeeded. I but guess. there was this very, uh, a blue collar working man. Uh, I'm not a pretentious artiste, right? He would push back against, I think, especially compared to Chaplin and Lloyd who were thought of as these very particular controlling, right. Uh, self-serious artist. He was like, my job's just to make pictures and make people laugh. And then kind of every couple of movies, he'd like swing for something bigger like a general. Uh, but I think he would try to keep that ambition in check and just be like, all I need is a picture where I get in a boxing ring. That's all I need. That's my job. Yeah, I'm little, so it'll be funny. And it is funny. It's funny. It's funny. This is the thing. He was right. You know what else is funny, though? Just this. 
I just think this the is funny. Oh, the, like the, the, the old fashioned uh, put them up. Yeah. Show me, show yeah. me your you dukes. Know, Marcus of Mar- Marquis of uh, Queensbury rules type boxing. Well, in right, the old you know. boxing posture where the tush is just all the way out, right. like you got a full diaper. Yeah, arched yeah. back. Well, you yes. know, the reason why you hold your fists like that in that kind of boxing is because you're not really wearing gloves. Right. And so the, the, you're, the you're, backs of the hands, you're saying, you, you need to lead with that. The backs and you're, of the you're trying to keep the other person's fist away from your face sure. as much as possible. And yeah. that, that kind of helps out. Right, it's, whereas once you got the gloves, this became like you can right lead sort of knuckle forward. over your face. Right. right, yeah. That's interesting. Hey, look, this is the kind of historical context, <laughs> hard facts. Boxing expert. Yes. <laughs> like, this is a main series on the films of Buster Keaton. It's called Podcast Junior. Today we're talking The General and Battling Butler, and our guest returning to the show, one of our favorite people, one of the smartest people on the planet. <laughs> Jamel Bowie. I feel uh, like being introduced as one of the smartest people on I'll, the planet. I mean, I don't, so I don't think it's true. <laughs> he wrote his own bio, by the way. Um, he did write his own bio, and he passed me a note card that said... <laughs> and he underlined that. Yeah, right. I, I underlined it, and then I had like a switchblade the Griffin. Yes. Yeah, right, right. Up to my You throat. were doing this. Yeah. <laughs> switchblade fist I did the fist again. Yeah. I, it is always a pleasure to be on the show. You guys know that I love you, and I love the show. Yeah, the so best. glad to be here. You, you tweeted about watching Buster Keaton movies with your son... A while ago, because we play on the show up. Oh, yeah. Very far in advance. And I immediately did the old DM slide. And I said, have I told you that we're, we, we have this on the books, that we want to do this? Uh, and immediately knew we had to get you on uh, for one of these to talk about two of them. Because uh, we're doing these all as uh, double features. Um, now, you, General was your pick. The General Battling Butler thing was your pick. I was hoping you would pick this. <laughs> just because. I mean, it's, kind of, it's kind of like me bait. It's a little, yes, yes, but it's also like this movie is, uh, I think, so uh, fascinatingly complicated as like a, a piece of American historical fiction. Right. And within it contains so much of what is weird about how our country mythologizes itself in its popular culture, uh, which is the kind of stuff you like to dig into. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I assume we'll get into it later, but mm. I think that the general is for as much as it does stand as a, an exemplary um, uh, piece of filmmaking, it's also extremely of its time. Yes. Like it's extreme, it's, it's, it's so specifically the middle of the 1920s in the United States that um, it's almost like striking how specific it is as a cultural artifact in that regard for a lot of, for a lot of reasons. That's what's fascinating about it is in its construction, it is maybe the most modern of his movies and the movie that is most accessible, but in its viewpoint and its attitudes, it is so of its moment where you watch something like Sherlock Jr. And you're like, well, this is very modern and relatable on a human behavioral level. Like I understand the motivations behind this and everything. Right. Uh, whereas the general just plays like, uh, any, it does. Yeah. Right. No. Yeah. You could make the general now. You could. And it's just like, it would be the same basic concept. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, you might want to make some tweaks just yeah. if you made it now, couple, in my opinion. I what would you notes. change? I have a notes pass. <laughs> I have a quick note. I pass. think I have a very fun laugh right now with my cold. I kind of have this yeah, David complimenting dying laugh. I'm I like, said there was no giggling allowed in this episode. I'm not David. giggling. I'm not giggling. Okay. Giggling would be different. You're That's guffawing. Like tea, right? I mean, yeah. if you were to remake the general, mm-hmm. you'd you'd kind of be like halfway to unstoppable. Yeah. Oh, the best movie. I mean, yes. Honestly, the general is easier to remake than unstoppable. No, there's a movie that you can't remake. <laughs> no. Unstoppable has my favorite Denzel moment ever, which is when Chris Pine tells him that he had a gun when he like confronted his his wife's mm-hmm. ex boyfriend or whatever. Yeah, and Denzel goes, "Whoa!" He literally <laughs> says, "Whoa!" I need to rewatch that movie. It's so good. It's also incredibly oh, rewatchable. Yeah, it's, it's like, also like ninety five minutes yeah, long. Yeah. Like it's very easy to rewatch. Yeah, were we having this conversation in some recent episode about like? Yeah, we were. I, I forget why. Ninety eight minutes. There you go. Best best final films in a career. Yeah, it's a it's a really good swap. And it's song. like it's sort of for an tragic swap reasons. Song, yes, it was right. not made with the intent, or you know, I think the, from the viewpoint of someone who thought it was their last film versus most bad final films are someone who's kind of lost their fastball and is fading out. Right, but no, but it's that's, like... That's one of the best final films in anyone's Because it's career. like him being like, I'm still the best at this. Right. 
I make these kinds of movies in a way that is unique and right. like unlike the other people who make these kinds of movies. And, uh, you know, give me an old star, give me a new star. It also, make them both do great stuff. It doesn't have the, uh, the self-importance right. of yes. certain, like, older, elder statesman filmmakers being like, here's the one, my final statement for the world. It's also in the incredible in my opinion, body of work that is Chris Pine's career. I mean, which, like, with every year, you're just kind of like, this guy is stacking bills. Like, yes. he's so good. Yes. yes. He keeps making the right choice. I don't mean any disrespect to the other person. When he makes the wrong choice, you're like, I get it, good. though. You yeah, know, right, like, you know, right. I like, get like, time. Don't, work, don't worry, darling, yes. or Wrinkle in Time. It's like, well, that was an interesting and also, filmmaker. He's you know? bad in none of these. No, he's always good. That's the thing. When he picks a wrong project, you're like, he comes out kind of looking the best of anyone in it. And it was cool that he signed up for it. He uses his, like, fame and his sort of, like, leading man status in the most interesting way. I mean, no disrespect to the other Chris's, but it is absurd to me anytime this is brought up as a debate. Right, right. When it's like he's running laps around the rest of them. He's, and, he has, he seems to have, like, almost total clarity about what his persona is. Totally gets yes. it. Yes. And right. knows exactly how to deploy it. Yes. And, yeah, and none of the other Chris's can can... Like Chris uh, Pratt can still barely figure out what he's trying to do. Yes, yeah, and, and and there's a weird balance to Pine where it's like he's really willing to hand himself over to like a director and yes. go like use my persona. And, I and have to, no ego. And to take like an off ball role, yeah. like Wonder Woman, Dungeons and Dragons, like these kinds of movies where he's like, I'll be yes. a star, but you don't need all of it to be Chris Pine. But also like, some yeah. of those guys in that position, the last thing they want to do is play the normal straightforward leading man because right. they're like, I need to hide behind yeah, ticks and weirdness or and whatever. Or, but yeah, Pine right. also is like, if that's what you wanted me, I can do that. Also, if you want the earnest version of this, I can do that. My guy's throwing fits. He, oh yeah, he oh, looks like yeah, he he looks true. incredible. He really does. <laughs> That's Absolutely. true. And what do you think that is? Like, he's, do you think he just has like a really good guy who like I you think know he finds just, some good yeah, stuff? I think, I think he, he works with good stylists. Yeah. I, I've told this story before on the podcast. You almost but he's to a party he's not with he's him. afraid he's not yeah. afraid to like go there and like be a little wild. Yeah, wear right. color. Right. Like just like wear uh untraditional kinds of uh, right. He also clothes. admittedly is a guy who looks good wearing anything. Yeah, well, he's one of those guys where it's like he looks good with short hair, long hair, yeah. clean shaven. But, he, but he's beard. kind of discovered that he 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 can pull off almost like a Diane Keaton look. Yes. <laughs> really? really? Yeah. Like like a Especially male when he had that long hair right, a like male for a Diane bit. Keaton and the flowing look. shirt. He went through like a something's got to give phase. Yeah. I feel and like looked, around He looked incredible. I would whenever whenever some of those photos I think it was like a Vogue shoot yeah. came out. I was like, Tess, my, my wife, like, right. have you have you seen how good Chris Incredible. Pine looks? Angelic. But then he also can just like throw on a leather jacket and fucking wayfarers and jeans and you're like, yeah, cool. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the story I've told a thousand times before on the podcast, Jamel, is Brennan Hines, friend of the show, past and future guest, invited me to a birthday party when I was in LA and he was like, I'm going to a birthday party with some friends if you want to come join us. And I was like, absolutely. I have no plans tonight. And then he was like, cool, Chris is driving. He'll come pick us up. He'll pick you up from your hotel. And I was like, Chris Pine? And he was like, yeah. And I went, I, I can't go. <laughs> I cannot. I cannot. Even though you probably did, even at the time, think, look, I know that guy's probably the chillest of the major Brandon stars is one or of whatever. My right. Very good friends. And, well, obviously, you know Brandon. Chris is one of his good friends. I have never met him. I don't, I'm yeah, not sure, on first sure, name sure. basis, but I've heard only the loveliest things about him. Right. And I was like, if I went to a party and Chris Pine was there, I would A, be starstruck, but B, I'd be like, well, I didn't know what I was getting into. Right. I'm going to feel emasculated just because my body sucks. I look like Your a pilot body is wet fine. laundry or whatever. Ah, get out of here. I, I have to stand in the same vicinity as him. But the idea of like getting into a car that he's driving and like opening the door and walking out with him into the, I was like, I can't do any of this. Well, I cannot do any of this. Uh, you I missed my up. chance. I fucked up really hard. Up so hard. What kind of car do you think he drives? This is, I couldn't deal with any of this. The That's a good DeLorean. question. I don't know. Yeah, Perhaps probably the a DeLorean. Tesla. <laughs> Maybe. Like, I like to think he's driving, like, a muscle car or something cool. No, he but... gives me, like, drives a sedan vibes. Oh. Right. He's just, like, pulling up in, like, a really nice, what? like, Look. infinity. Yeah. But, but I can yeah. also <laughs> see, like, him be having a vintage, like, Land Rover. But yeah. is, is he oh. not proving our point here? Oh, Any yeah. car we imagine like, having he, he is could cool. pull that off. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Family mid-sized sedan? Fuck, that would be cool. He pulls up in a golf vintage cart. Vintage muscle like, car. All right, pup. 
<laughs> fucking cool. You know, Pine drives a golf cart? That's fucking cool. He's got power and wheels. And he handles in it. He He's has a good. power he wheels car. He has a power wheels car. Cool. That's fucking cool. All right, cool. we should talk about Buster Keaton. Can okay. I just say one thing? Please. You can say anything. About Chris Pratt. As long as we don't talk over each other. Yeah. Yeah, we can never do that. Yeah, it's illegal. I, I'm just going to say, I think I should be brave on this podcast and say things that people aren't going to like. Brave and strong. I think he is excellent in Guardians <laughs> of the is. Galaxy 3. I cut all this out, so it's just, I think, <laughs> and then we just get back into it. <laughs> you just hear that I'm agreeing, and no one ever hears yep. what mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> That would be funnier. No. I think I think Chris Pratt's given a lot of very like weird phone new performances yes. recently. I think he's like clearly in some kind of crisis over what his persona uh -huh. is. He talks about Jesus a lot. I, yeah. I don't mind people talking about Jesus if they he's want to, but it's not really my layer, area he, of interest. He is Jesus is right to me. Yeah, exactly. But He is know. obsessed with people criticizing him in a way that is absolutely a self-perpetuating problem. Right. It's like, Chris, chill. Like, yes. log off. You're doing okay. great. Right. You're you're successful. I you have a lot of fans. so good in Guardians 3. Have you seen it yet? Probably Joe? haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet. I liked it significantly less than you did oh, but really? that was almost my immediate takeaway why was, didn't you like it uh, we can well, talk we can about talk this about off mic all right talk not because i don't want to because uh oh god that's I, a movie where he's just like i'm gonna do what this absolutely. requires of me and you know frame I'm one in the hands of the director frame and, one right. and you're like right this is why you became a movie star right and can I, you please not yeah. lose sight of this he's a guy who's got a very specific strike zone but within it, he is so effective, yeah. and he keeps on losing sight of what his movie star persona is. Whereas fucking Pine, Piney, he's got perfect control. Piney and, could and the throw range. a ball at the third baseline, yes. and the umpire would be like, "Strike, <laughs> clean, clean strike." <laughs> Took the words right out of my mouth. That was the exact analogy I was. Getting. Well, you said strike, so yeah. no, Pratt, roll with it. Pratt is phenomenal in that movie. He's great. All he's right. Great. Um, should we talk about the, oh, well, but I mean, Buster Keaton in general, Jamel, yeah. I feel like we, you know, do, do you have sort of a general, not the general, a yeah. general. And by the way, let's uh, make it very clear on, just because of filmmaker. recent things we've covered on this podcast for anyone who's confused. This film is not a biopic of Rosario Dawson's vagina. No, right. right. We, that is we what did find out in our episode yeah. on trance, the Danny Boyle film that Rosario Dawson refers to her vagina as the general. Oh, yes. yeah. I mean, she said that the general was mad one day. When public specific, information. It's, yep. Now she talked about it. Yes. Um, um, yep. No, this is about, well, it's about a train, but in general, Buster Keaton, yeah. what do you think? I am a fan. Yes. I really enjoy watching Buster Keaton films. Uh, 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 Griffin mentioned that I had talked about watching Buster Keaton movies with my son, um, who is like old enough to like watch stuff now. He's five now? He's almost five. Okay. And the reason I do that is because it's for a couple of reasons. The first is that I am on uh, TikTok enough that I see young people complain about black and white movies mm -hmm. and it fills mm -hmm. me with absolute dread it is to a bummer. Have, have children. The idea of having For children sure. that if I wanted to like pop on, you know, the Manchurian candidate, okay. they'd be like, I don't want to watch that because it's in black and white. You gotta pop you gotta cut that off at the pass. Right. You gotta so right, it's, set it's, the right tone in your household. And so yeah. it's it's part of it is sort of like let's actually just start introducing really early stuff and yeah. kind of like getting him Use because they have no prior context, right? So just like getting him used to the idea that things can look different, and uh, because I'm a photographer and have lots of black and white photos and prints and stuff at home, he also is sort of aware of the fact that like that pictures can be in black and white and they represent color. You want this to um, exist in his perception of the world, right? Yes, and that's the first reason. Yeah. The second reason is that the great thing about the silent comedies is that they did provide so much of the visual language for early American animation. Yes. And so for a kid, watching Buster Keaton is extremely legible. Right. Because if they've seen cartoons. It steps yeah. away from Looney Tunes or right. whatever. They right. immediately get what is actually the intent of what is happening. And I think there is something in Buster's persona. We've talked about this in the other episodes that is very much like a child and his understanding of what's going on around him. Right. His sort of like guilelessness, right? Without being dumb. He's like slightly oblivious or his perception of things is a little bit skewed and he sort of just like enters into situations. Um, but his comedy is also so behavioral in a way that I think like a young child can lock into. They understand the language of what he's doing because it's in their understanding of learning how to read people around them right, and situations exactly. and everything. It's it's very close to the perception of a little kid. And so yes. that's the other reason I like to watch it with them because he can actually really enjoy them 
um, in a way that is not necessarily the case. Like I would like to watch some Marx Brothers with them, but that's so it's that's so verbal. Yes. Yeah, you need to be like a couple years older for yeah. that, I guess. And, and yeah. the Marx Brothers movies are so much about uh, uh, class and like social mores and all these things. Like you need to understand not only like adult society. But then, like, entrench yourself in some sort of understanding of what it was like a hundred years ago. On yeah. top of that, sure, yeah, yeah. There's um, society movies. But yeah, I, I, I like whatever. Buster Keaton. The other thing for me, as for me talking about liking Buster Keaton, is that sort of like my the way I got to Buster Keaton was through Jackie Chan, mm-hmm. um, which I think is probably the case for a lot of people who are right. just like interested, who like either love Jackie Chan and are the kind of person who wants to sort of like learn more about the guys influences and, and so, you are on the record of course uh when a couple years ago during our march madness we yes. let you pick a candidate you pick jackie chan and you proudly disclaim that your political stance is defund the police but fund the police story that's right defund mm-hmm. the police but fund the police story we have and, to fund and the super cops <laughs> yes and the fu- we have to <laughs> we need more super fun cops here. there's been a lot of them not uh, enough. Okay. Not enough. If you look at the annals of film history, there are a weird amount of films that are not police stories. <laughs> sure. That's true. That's true. I don't mean stories about policemen. I mean proper entries in the police story franchise. Right, right, uh, right, right, right. Jamel, the, the anti-silent black and white bias you're talking about, you're seeing from people on TikTok, TikTok is so fascinating to me because as many smarter people than I have pointed out and written about at length, there is something really fascinating about how... TikTok has gotten closer to something approximating silent film language and especially silent comedy language when you look at the things that go very viral and they rarely have dialogue. There are obviously a lot of TikToks that are based on talking, but so much of them are behavioral, involve on-screen captions like intertitles, right. are using camera positions and performance to convey something very quickly. And it's like, they don't understand it, but the people who are on TikTok saying they don't want to watch these types of movies are actually more fluent in this language than many generations before them. Right. Yes, I think that's exactly right. That um, just the the constraints of that medium are essentially reinventing early yes. techniques, uh, but for a variety of reasons. I mean, some of it is just some of it is just a standard being young and not really wanting to look at old stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, some of it is. I mean. I don't know. I'm not going to psychologize too much, but I, I there there is asking someone with no familiarity with not just black and white films, but like older films that have like a, a different editing rhythm that have mm-hmm. a different kind of style of direction. And not I'm not even I'm not just talking about like the 20s and the 30s, but like you know asking someone to watch a movie from the 50s and they don't really watch anything before yes. 1980, and you're asking them really to sort of like learn how to watch a movie in a different way. You come across people, uh, I, I I do often, people who I think of as being sort of like uh, intelligent and cultured and curious. Sure. Who try watching. <laughs> on the internet? You're sure? Okay. I'm talking Sorry, more in real life. Okay. Actual IRL. conversations I've IRL. had with people IRL who try watching like great films from the 70s and are like, it's just too slow for me. You know, they can't deal with like the shagginess of <clears throat> 70s new Hollywood stuff. Yeah. Uh, but they can deal with Netflix shows. This, take a season to do anything. This is my fucking thing. Tapping my watch. I know. You should beep that out too. Just keep doing that. Yeah. Don't do that to be quick. Before or, you go. Or, or, do, or it. do it. Or do yeah. it. Um, yeah, no. It's uh, Well, silent movies especially. Yeah. They, you know, they required some discipline or whatever in our phone addicted culture they do. I mean, they do. A, I mean, you, that's the theater. biggest thing you actually them. do have you you cannot take your eyes away you have you to watch you have to fully engage all the yeah like right. there's it's like like you can kind of watch a basketball game looking at your phone right because yeah. if you've got the sound on you'll know when something's about to happen they're narrow yeah and like you'll just hear the crowd or the announcer right. get a little more excited and you're like all right let me look up you can't do that with a silent movie. You I know can't. everyone knows this, and it's very right. obvious to say, but the most you're going to hear is a piano going like, do, 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 like right. that. And also, like th- none of these have definitive scores. No. So even if you're just going off the music, it's like, depends where you're watching it. Right. Depends how you're watching it, you know? There's no like definitive version where that's going to guide you through the story better than one or the other. It's all subjective. Yeah. None of it is like the specific director's intent of how that score is being employed. Um, 
It's an interesting thing. I know this is our first episode to come out in this mini series since our first episode was released in this mini series. Yes. And it has been really heartening to me to see how many people have been watching these for the first time. Absolutely. And having that feeling the reaction of like, was really nice. Oh shit, that's say. funny. Right. Like I've just seen a lot of like, I was actually cracking up at this. In a way where they're going into this, as you know, I think a lot of this is like the framing in our culture of just like, I'm watching this for historical purposes. I'm watching this for a sense of film history and knowledge rather than expecting to get genuine enjoyment out of this in the way it was intended for its audience at the time. Right, right. right. And I think that's just to, just I know to to move on, but I just want to emphasize that point. I think what is so rewarding when you can convince people to watch not just a silent comedy, but like older films is if you can convince them to kind of just like try to put themselves as much as possible in the mindset of an audience member, you'll find that the stuff still works. Yeah. It still works. It still is affecting. It's not dated. It's different, but it's not necessarily dated. No, no. Um, I'll say for battling Butler, I had a good chuckle when he falls into the lake and like tips his hat to the, to the, the mountain lady as she goes by. I thought that was a good bit. I laughed. It's good. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Let's start <laughs> with Battling, great Battling okay. Butler is chronologically the first movie we are yes. discussing. So we might, I will also give you just a little bit of context about Please, it. I love, I'm a, um, I love We talked context. about this. I'm connoisseur of context. You are. Uh, we talked about this on, uh, I think, uh, I talked about this on, maybe. oh, we talked about this a little bit on the next episode. Okay. Think, sorry. We've been going sorry. a little out of order. Um, maybe. We, I don't. I don't know. I don't remember. Uh, but uh, Buster Keaton did have the rights to this story that was about a skyscraper. Yes. That he kept trying to crack and couldn't figure out. We talked about this on Jamie's episode. I just don't remember where it is. Yeah, I don't remember where it is in the timeline. But but yes, this was sort of his his great, his Waterloo project. He could never crack the skyscraper movie. Which sounds fun. Like, it's like girders, skyscraper, like, you know, guys up on the, you know, in the sky. The premise of this movie basically was like a a giant skyscraper being built. And this guy and his love interest getting stuck stuck at the top of this in construction skyscraper right and you have it feels like it's kind of his die hard minus the terrorists yeah. <laughs> right but it is like how does buster keaton deal with modern architecture being at raised heights uh being on steel girders and scaffolding and all this sort of shit and the reason it never got made was they could never figure out how to get down from the building. Yeah, he just could not like put a plot together. Right. Yes, even they, the they, they never so had fun. a draft for the camp with a good end for the movie. Right. Yeah. Um, the other thing he purchases around the same time he purchases this uh, this skyscraper concept mm-hmm. is Battling Butler. There's a British musical that yes. had been running on the, the 42nd Street in the Selwyn yep. Theater. Big hit. Uh, which have music and lyrics, uh, which is why those music and lyrics are credited on yes. screen, even though obviously this movie does not have music contractual and obligation. But he saw it and was just like, "That's a very good, simple premise that I could fit he into." He just like right the the false identity thing. He right. liked the you know the right. uh, the the swap. A sort of fancy lad has right. the same who is trying to prove his sort of masculinity and grit to the world. Finds out he has the same name as a a, a tough guy boxer. And sort of allows the mistaken identity to happen. Right. Which leads to them then needing to prove himself in the ring. Which is like, yeah, perfect Buster Keaton setup. Um, in the stage play, uh, the, the character Buster would eventually play, mm-hmm. um, does, but does this whole thing of becoming the prize fighter to escape uh, his ball and chain wife. Eh, less... Uh... <laughs> Kind of classic, but That's yeah. Sympathetic, I would say. Right, exactly. Uh, yeah. So they switch that to uh, he's trying to impress a lady, right. not uh, he's trying to escape Which is lady. almost always the Buster movie is. Yeah. Buster exists in this world. Everyone else sort of like judges his perceived lack of masculinity. He doesn't care until he realizes if I assume the role of how men are supposed to behave in society or in this moment, in this culture – whatever sort of silo that movie is focused on, then perhaps that is the thing that wins her over. Right. He's always sort of assuming a role, a task. Yeah. Not always, but that's often the setup. Um, And this adds the fun mistaken identity thing on top of the what if Buster tried to be a boxer. The other problem he has with the original story is how it ends with just like, oh, you don't actually have to do it, you know? Yeah. And so he's like, that would be too boring as an ending. So. We have to tack on, you know, all the other stuff. The fight in the dressing room is basically his way of being like, can we have a more fun, action-packed ending? Yeah. Not just like, it's you're more, okay. It's more dramatically satisfying, too. 100%. Just like, yeah. Uh, I agree. And the movie was a huge hit. 
Uh, we can talk about it now, but basically, it's one of Buster Keaton's favorites. But that's partly because it did really well, and he was really sure. happy about that. Like, which just seems to be how he feels about his career when he is like interviewed retrospectively. And you know, anytime people think he's like, "Yeah, well, that one did really well." So, but also, like, boxing is a weirdly cinematic sport, right? Sure. Not that weird. Well, it's. I think. Let me let me correct myself here. I I think boxing's prominence in cinema relative to its prominence in sports culture at large is kind of interesting to me. Mm. But it's because it is so cinematic. It yes. is so like simple and boiled down in its dramatics, in its framing, in its staging, and it comes down to like two people with very clear right, action. Which is very cinematic. I will yes. say also, boxing has just not been as relevant in our lives. Yeah, I was about That's to true. say. But it used to be so That's much true. more. Boxing, yeah. boxing used to be the sport in right. part yes. because it was so accessible and so they're hitting each other i mean they're, they're just huge but who, who he, hits more <laughs> than the other guy who hit the guy but who like, hit you could other? you could say it was it was more democratic right yeah like yes. you you any any anyone sufficiently strong enough could be a boxer right and so schools you know uh uh, uh robert ryan is in a boxing picture the setup mm -hmm. and um Part of why he was cast is that he was a collegiate boxer, and that was like a thing that used to be very common. That like high, high schools, colleges, like sure. boxing, which is the thing that people did recreationally. Get get, get everyone, all these teenagers, aggression out as well. Just right. let them run around yeah. the ring throwing punches. Um, I just feel like Mike Tyson at all, like the the, the mid nineties, is sort of the end of superstar boxing in a way that you know it's sort of all dwindling after that. You still have like. Lennox Lewis or, you know, you have a few like, uh, you know, Pacquiao, Mayweather. Pacquiao, Mayweather and all that. But right. like it does get supplanted by UFC and stuff and like become kind. It's not like that boxing is irrelevant. Now, right. But, but it, it's it, it used to. Be, I mean, OK, I'll put it this way. It used to be so culturally significant, like that Ali beat Foreman or, right. or sure. Foreman, you know, or that, you know, yeah. Joe, uh, Joe, Wait, was Joe, John, Joe, uh, Jack Johnson, Jack Johnson. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Jack Johnson. Uh, wins the title and there are riots in American cities. Right? Sure, like right, that's sure. that's used to be the significance of boxing. That's a, no, this is all true. There is that weird, sort of, you know, like you can't tell me that's the strongest guy. Like back then, you know, yeah. like the, yeah. the weird charged. Yeah, boxing's right. weird. Boxing's so weird. Yeah, it's still weird. It is just kind of wild. Hitting like the percentage punch, 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 of like canonical boxing movies, oh, both yeah. in terms of yeah. like like pop culture staying power, critical reception box office grosses at the time. You know, it's just like, it, it's a big footprint. It is just also compelling. It's like, why would someone do this? You know? Yeah. And the reasons are often compelling. I like that when boxers retire, they have to open a restaurant. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> and they walk around and going, they, hey, how you doing? And they yeah. show up and they, go, oh, and they take a picture with yeah, someone, right. you know? They let you pretend that you're punching them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Retired boxers are fun. Oh, or depressing. Yeah, I was about yeah. to say, they're either fun <laughs> or yeah, yeah, they yeah, have yeah. suffered debilitating. It's brutal. Uh, they got punched yeah. in the head so much. Yes. It's so weird. It's so weird that that's just like, there's like federations that govern the punching of heads. Like, you know what <laughs> yes. I mean? Or our tum-tums. Yeah, sure. Tum -tums. You work the body. That's true. We, we, I've talked about this a lot before on, on Mike, but my brother almost became a boxer. Uh, he, he had a, a Golden Gloves license and everything and was sort of right on the precipice of maybe trying to pursue it as a semi-professional thing. Uh, yep. You know, within low level featherweight. Yeah, uh, your brother is small. Five but foot I mean, six. Small boxers division. are kind of cool. Uh, yes, he, he was very good at it. Uh, and then the first time he had like a licensed fight where he was uh, up against someone whose only career path in life was boxing, he was like, "Oh, I don't care about this that much. Yeah, I like doing this. Yeah. The 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 field of people who this is their whole thing." is a very different relationship than I have to this sport. But growing up, uh, he he made the the desktop background on the family computer. Uh, or I guess we had different family profiles. But whenever he was using the computer, his background was like a slow motion shot of a guy getting punched in the jaw. Sure. Where it's like the, his the, whole the face is rippling going, and the spit's coming right, out. Right, and yeah. my mother would just walk in and like see the computer screen and be like, please don't do this. <laughs> <laughs> please don't like, you're constantly showing me the most barbaric image in the world and trying to get my permission to pursue this professionally i would i too would not when he was like my 13 child to box old. yeah you know i might i might be anxious about it. all right all right the beginning of batting butler yes 
I do love Buster Keaton as a fancy boy. I was going to say. He's very good at it. He's really good at the fancy lad stuff. Yes. Yes. His his sort of his flat pan, as he calls it, his blank expression, his yes. great stone face, can be used very well as this sort of disaffected, oblivious yeah, board aristocrat. Right. Yeah. The board aristocrat thing, but he he's able to do it without a sort of um, uh, unpleasant pomposity. You buy it as the sort of like board aristocrat thing without him being despicable. Right. You right. know? Because you see, a lot of comedies like this very often in the movies where he's playing someone of a low, lower social class, the villain, his romantic rival, is a guy like this played by a taller man who comes on screen and you're immediately like, fuck this guy. <laughs> and Buster can play this role at the center of a movie and you're like, he's foolish, but I don't hate him out of hand immediately. Right. You know, you want to see him get smarter and more aware. Well, the thing is, is that once he does perk up, mm -hmm. his everything about him changes. Yes. Because he, he, it's like, it, it's, it's like the bored aristocrat thing is the the air he's putting on, right? But his actual self is something much more playful and yes, appealing, which is fun. You get to watch him sort of unlock what we want him to be. But he, yes, he's just. He's so good at it. He's so good at all this sort of like very minute body language, behavioral stuff. Uh, I mean, we'll get to it in the general, but the scene where he gets back in line and pretends to be the bartender <laughs> and the shift is so slight. But like this film is such a great study of, of just him basically stripping away all the airs of this guy. Uh, David. Yes. I'm reading... Oh, on you. You're not supposed to be doing that. I'm reading you for filth. Okay. And I'm getting the sense you've been stewing about a health problem you have. Uh, okay. What's my health problem? Your health problem is you're not using ZocDoc. Uh, you mean because I'm instead, I'm texting the group chat with yeah. my symptoms. I'm right. Googling rando stuff. Exactly. I'm not going to find quality medical advice in the group chat. No, Griffin. you can find it from ZocDoc. And it's ironic that your problem, what ails you, is actually you knowing you should use something like ZocDoc but not doing it. Um, well, because look, there are thousands of medical professionals yeah, exactly. at ZocDoc who are there to help you. Yeah. Look, they listen like a friend and they give you the expert care you need. I know, because ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors mm -hmm. who are patient-reviewed Take your insurance, are available when you need them, and treat almost every condition under the sun. Look, t health insurance is a real a real pain in the tuchus, right? All right, language. No, I'm going to say it. It's a pain in the tuchus. You know, and, it, and nothing's worse than, uh, you know, you, you think you finally have identified what your problem is and who the specialist is you should see, and you find out they're not covered by your insurer. And ZocDoc is just a good way to get ahead of that problem. Yeah, well, look. You might be scouring the internet for questionable reviews of doctors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With ZocDoc, you have a trusted guide to connect you to your favorite doctor you haven't met yet. Mm -hmm. Millions of people use the free act to find and book a doctor in their neighborhood who's patient reviewed and fits their needs and schedule just right. Okay? Okay. So you can use the app. No alarms. No surprises. Go to ZocDoc.com slash check and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. Many are available within 24 hours. Ding dong. No. What? What are you saying that to me for? Who's at the door? I don't know. I have to get it, but it's not my fault. I'm in the middle of the, the ad read. Well, let me just check quickly. I'm literally in the middle of the... No, say the thing then. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash check. ZocDoc dot com slash check. I understand the timing was bad, and I didn't want to interrupt you, but someone's at the door. I don't want to be rude. Dude, I should get the door. Bad, read. Okay. Get to make good. I'm going to open the door. What? Right? Creek. Hey, I'm sorry. I don't have time for an ad read today. Okay, fine. Go away, busy Dr. doctor. Dr. Jeffrey Rush. It's, yes, he's my least favorite character. You better start believing ghost stories, because you're, you're in one right now. <laughs> All right. ZocDoc.com slash check. Download the app today. And I messed up the line, but you got the joke I was making. Yeah, you know. It's Pirates of the Caribbean. Bar, 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 it's not me, Barbara but it's a different... Rosa, we have the same name. name is, yeah, yeah. yeah it's Doctor in a Rush. Battling Butler. He's he's in the lap of luxury. He's told, you know, you're going to go on a camping trip. It'll do you some good. You got to toughen up. 
So he brings his butler, played by Snitz Edwards, Our the friend. great Snitz Edwards, with one of wonderful face he has, who right. is in um, Seven Chances. He's sort of the anti Buster Keaton in that his face is all personality. Yes. There's too much going on in his face at all times. And I do very much enjoy just his version of camping. He has a brass bed. Yes. He has, you know, a big fancy. Uh, he's wearing you know, his gloves and he's chest got his... of drawers. Right. He's yes. got a fucking icebox. He's and got a an stove. icebox. Yes. They go shooting and they just kind of look around. Uh, and a bunch of pheasants and stuff, and they're like, there's nothing here to shoot. Well, no, because he's bad at everything. He's bad, yeah. right. That's uh-huh. such a good sequel. I mean, this is where you're just like, he was he was so tight in his visual storytelling of that sequence where he steps out, and then you get the nature photography, the close-ups of all the different animals out in the wild, and you think it's just sort of like environmental establishing shots, and then it cuts back to him saying, there's nothing here for me to shoot. <laughs> Yeah. And he's like using cinematic language to you don't even realize he's setting up a joke until the punchline hits you. Um, but this is inversion of the usual Buster Keaton dynamic where it's often like the woman is of a higher social class than him. Right. The parents are trying to set her up with someone of a similar social class. He's a working man who's trying to get her attention and prove himself to her. In this, it's he immediately falls in love with a wild mountain woman <laughs> who lives in the woods with like her trapper family. And he needs to prove that he's as like tough and like rough and rumble and of the land as they are. Because um, uh, he doesn't get it. I think it's really funny that he meets this woman by he cocks his gun backwards under his arm, yes. shoots it, and then hits her handkerchief, right? Yes. Like that's what he does. That's when she gets mad at him. Mm-hmm. You've also got the gag of him putting out the camping chair and then it goes straight into the ground. And she's a lot of fun in she's this. She's fun. Like, she gets to be a real, like, firecracker. Yeah, Sally O'Neill is yeah. the actress. Uh, did she ever work with him again? Not that I can he see. He rarely repeated yeah. leading ladies. But I think this is one of the ones where, I mean, General, also to its advantage, lets the female lead get in on the action more. Yeah. But this is the one where she's more of, like, a challenge to him. Right. You know? Yes, absolutely. Which is She's kind yelling of fun. at him. Yes. Well, he's such a doofus. Yes. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's a lot of camp business. There's a canoe bit. Oh, good. Uh, him trying to shoot the duck from the canoe is funny. I mean, this is like the, the Buster Keaton use every part of the buffalo sort of thing of like, even if the plot has to get to him... Taking no, it's on a lot the identity of, setup. Yeah. of uh, the boxer. He's it's like, it's like I'm, one of those Simpsons episodes where you're like, this is about boxing? Like right. the first seven minutes. You're like, they don't to go do to with... Itchy and Scratchy Land until minute 14. <laughs> but, but part of it is like, for him, it's like, if I've gone to a campsite, I'm going to get every good bit I can out of Fancy Guy Goes Camping. Right. I'm in no rush to get to the plot setup. Um, Why got, would I leave bits on the table? Right. You got her big dad and brother who are, you know, big and scary. Yes. Large, scary people, always a good bit, always funny. Can Especially we say... against Buster Keaton. Yes. Yeah. Another thing that's great about Snitz... Yeah. Snitz is shorter than him. Yeah, Snitz is very small. Snitz is maybe the only man in Buster Keaton movies who ever makes Buster Keaton look a little big. Right. His leading lady is usually basically the exact same size as him. They're Everyone else like in the world is him. so much He's bigger. He's so skinny. Yes. And then yeah. Snitz is like tiny. Yeah, Snitz is small. Yes. And he's like old. He's shriveled. Yes. I say this with love. Yes. Um, they have He has the date with the girl where they're at the table and the table keeps sinking into the ground. The sinking into the ground is a very underrated, easy, simple bit of practical yes. comedy. Yeah, and just it, it's... Like it ends with them doing a picnic. It's funny. But but the joke isn't that the table is sinking. The joke is he refuses to accept that the right. table is sinking. That will not get in the way of his flirtation. Um, yes. Okay. So the advantage of these movies is I can just cue them up and like, I know. that's what I'm doing too. Them. Yes. Uh, just remember because uh, they are silent. Uh, and then yeah, about twenty minutes in is finally like so. There's a guy with your name who's and a it's prize found the newspaper. Fighter, right? Yeah. Here's your end. Um, and that's I guess when he he tries to impress. Right. The uh, big boys, the big cowboy hatted boys, uh-huh. with no, I'm no, I'm no shrimp, I'm no coward. Like I am, here I am, the battling butler. Yeah, and uh, you know, there you go. I mean, the butler kind of pimps him into it. Yes, Nitz is really pro this. Yeah, I think he's kind of left. That's his only option as far as like convincing the dad and the brother. Well, there's nothing like anything he's trying to do in real time before their eyes fails. Right. But he can take on a reputation that has already been established, that has a paper trail, and he thinks just sort of wear it and go, see, here's the proof without needing to actually 
like prove any of that to them. I mean, he is wearing a tux yes. in the woods. He is. Which yeah. is an insane thing to do. <laughs> but it makes actual sense because he's like a boxer. Yes. There's something about that that just works. Well, and what, what you're saying, very like Jamel nice about... Later. I'm sorry, what? He's a very nice tweed suit later. Very, I thought very, you were saying these are very nice tweets. These which are some very nice We should never, later. ever... That should be dropped from our vocabulary as a people. It. I didn't say it. Thank God. Um... No, but what you were saying, Jamal, about like boxing being this more democratic sport, right? It's sort of like, well, they already see him as a fancy man. But if he's only fancy because he earned his way there through boxing, right, right. retroactively, they're less judgmental. And even though, yeah, he's small, he's a lightweight fighter, yeah. you know, so they respect him. He's in the he James E. Newman talent, division. He has yeah. grit. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Uh, any other thoughts? This training dummy. On the uh, beginnings? Okay, you have a training dummy. All right, yes. The other thing, I guess, his relationship with the woman is very settled 15 minutes in. She yes. loves him. Yes. Like, it's all good. Right. He's not pursuing her anymore. No. I mean, he has to impress her. Yes. But uh, he's not He's not uh, worrying about that anymore. No. Um, the training dummy, is that what happens? Because they go see the boxer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they go see the boxer. Right. You, see, you see the battling butler. He's some pretty the... good fighting, you yes. know. Like, yeah. Yeah. He beats the uh, what's the guy's name? Alabama uh, something. Yes, um, absolutely, Alabama something. I don't remember. Well, it's the the Alabama murderer. Yeah, yes, that's right. That's the Alabama yes. murderer. Yes, yes, very evocative. Yeah. Um. So he sees Battling Butler beats the Alabama murderer. Uh. Uh. And then, because in my head, what happens is they're on the train heading, heading Pretty much. back. Yeah. Exactly. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. right. And he's like, I have to tell her the truth. This is like, you know, I can't keep this up. But then he is welcomed as the battling butler right. on the train. Right. And the actual battling butler sees this and yes. just sort of like, what the fuck? Right. Yeah. Who doesn't really look like him, by the no, way. That's no. What, and I had to think about it for a sec. But, you know. People are probably listening. They're listening to fights, right? You, it's not necessarily yeah, you're going to sure. you you actually really know see what anyone. Looks like apart right. from this, like one picture of them in right. a stance or whatever. They have similar hair. Yeah. Well, like, what was there? No discussion of having Buster play both characters in some sort of feat of you know, yeah, double acting. That's like, what I initially uh, Prince thought. Prince of the Popper. Me too. Yeah. I thought it was going to be like, oh, there's a tough Buster and a silly Buster. But but that would get in the way of. It's nice that the final fight is actually good. Yes, right? no, hundred percent. Right? Like you, and I don't know how you would, comedically yeah. he could maybe pull off something like uh, what's it call it the playhouse, right? Where yeah, he's using crazy roles. photography to and doubles to do it. Right. But it's nice that the final fight is a real fight. There's like emotional catharsis to that. Um, I mean, this is uh, you know a, a lot of as Buster went on in the general's big like proof of this is he sort of was refining what he felt were uh, changing sensibilities in the audience away from them just wanting silly slapstick gags. He got increasingly obsessed with, you need to have a real story, emotional stakes, right. you know, characters you can root for, things they can triumph over. You need to be able to, like, hang a hat on, on your narrative. Um, so I think, yeah, it's like he's no longer going for, I was watching, there's a really great, uh, every fame, a painting video mm -hmm. about Buster Keaton mm -hmm. and his approach to filmmaking, uh, which is a great shot chaser with the every frame painting Jackie Chan video, which is like one of the best. Those are just two perfect, like 10 minute distillations of how to read their movies and value what they did in their process and everything. Um, but there's some audio interview that he uses in that video with Buster Keaton talking about, like, as his career went on, he tried to move further and further away from cartoon gags, sure. he called it, which were sort of like Looney Tunes-esque rewriting of the universe around you for the gag has to be earned through personality, through behavior. Yeah. And something like him playing both guys, I think, is more of a cartoon gag sort right. of thing. Yeah, that makes sense. And yeah. these movies are longer and slower. Yes, they do spend more time trying to invest you in everybody and like lay out the like rather than just do like bit bit bit. His approach know. was sort of like first 15, 20 minutes really set up the stakes of the thing and then you can stack the gags up. An advantage to this movie is his fancy lad persona is so funny. The first 15, 20 minutes of plot building are also funny. Right. Because just him doing it, going through the motions is funny. I I do wonder how much of it though is like 
Chaplin's movies at this same time are getting more and more openly emotional. Sure. Right? Right. Chaplin's movies are very beautifully emotional. Yes. Right. Which I love. Right. But, you know, Buster was very unsentimental in his approach. He's not going to try to outdo Chaplin on that level. But I do think he was like, there needs to be a narrative rigor to my films. Right. I can't just be doing just silly goofs. Um, Chaplin, of course, is also a famous boxing movie. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, the training dummy. What do you t- t- talk to me about just, the training I just dummy? I think this dummy is so It's a big sabudio. That's fun. for our British listeners. S- I'm sorry, what? It's a big sabudio. What is a big sabudio, David? <laughs> sabudio is is a British board game of I guess it's a board game that's like soccer. It's like you play it on a big mat with these like guys who are standing on these little semicircles. Oh, who are little weeble wobbles? Exactly. And you, you sort of flick them and, and they like do football. Oh, okay, I see. Okay. Uh, right. I don't know why it's called Sabudio, but uh, anyone who's from the UK knows what I'm talking about. I and just, he's a big, because he's in a big wibble wobble. Yeah. yeah. I think this dummy's really funny. It's yeah. very well designed. It has these like flappy arms. Yeah. Where it, it, without feeling like unrealistic, anytime he punches it, it just sort of moves wildly and will just always hit him even when it doesn't feel like it should be that. Threatening. I think there should be a new boxer called the Alabama Murderer. Someone should claim that <laughs> moniker. Yeah. <laughs> what a straightforward, I'm from Alabama and I'm going to murder I'm you. I'm murdering you in the ring. How do you uh, think he got the name? I don't know. Uh, I mean, back knows? then you could kill and get away with it pretty easily. So yeah. he might have actually just murdered someone. And um, he did it enough times that they were like, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> you're really, you're, you're really, really hooked on that. It was yeah. like a legal to like, it was legal to like poison or shoot somebody as long as you did in a boxing ring. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> you just had to break into like a gym. Um, yeah, there's all just a lot of boxing stuff. There's the dummy. There's him yeah. sparring with the real Alfred. There's, right. I don't know, you know, just a lot of great physical humor. Um, he also yeah. keeps flirting with the guy's wife. The guy's wife. Yes. Yeah, but, Inadvertently. But one of my, my favorite bits is when he is trying to help her change the light bulb in her room, and then the actual battling butler is like, what the hell? What's going on in there? And um, then the light goes and out. The light goes out, yeah. and he's like, oh, my God. He's sleeping with my wife. Yes. It's very funny. Very funny. Uh, there's this bit where he's just sort of like winding up and trying to spar with the really big guy, and he keeps missing him. Yeah. That's really funny. I also I think it's funny when uh, when they get uh, married and the, he just says, "Promise me we never camp and you never come see me fight." <laughs> right, <laughs> like he <yes>. just immediately <laughs> right, he lays out the yeah I'm too crazy you don't right, want to see right. what an animal like, I am you yeah. can't the reason I'm not <laughs> um, yeah there's a sort of it's Rocky esque uh, training montage where they like run across a farm and right. run like with a car that like gets flipped over right I mean it, it, it this is the thing it's such it's such a good setup for Buster because he's going to take everything so seriously. So, like, you know things are going to, like, fuck with him. You know he's going to fall down. You know he's going to get hit or whatever. But he's never going to play it goofy. He's going to play it with the intensity of a fighter who is just not equipped for this. I see another good bit, and this is when they're they're coming, they're coming to, I guess, this country town, is they're driving, and uh, the, his butler is like, he says to him, we got to drive carefully because, you know, these are country folk yeah and then everyone's driving like a maniac <laughs> yeah i thought that was pretty funny uh well you were mentioning he's fighting with the because he basically gets pawned into pawned off to be the fighter right yes. like mm-hmm. I, I guess it's just basically like the actual battling butler's upset with him flirting with his wife right. who he also there is that weird cut of her the next day with the black eye yeah that's not good no that's not chill sure i don't well, like that it's a hundred year old movie don't like it yeah, yeah. don't yeah. like it but, but you know, he because the battling butler has to have a rematch with the alabama murderer yes and so um he at, at a certain point he's like listen you're gonna fight the alabama murderer right and i'm just gonna watch to see this unfold and that yeah. kind of takes you to the, like the the last segment of the film sure yeah right where they like they watch a different fight happened and the guy gets the ship beat out. There's like an ambulance parked outside. Yeah. There's all this stuff going on. But that's all, also just like such good use of Buster Stoneface of like, show us a real boxing match. And then right. anytime you cut to him in the stands wearing a tuxedo, just blank faced expression, you can project all the terror onto him. <laughs> right. Of what he's gotten himself into. Um, Seeing boxing at like a real level. And yeah. then his wife shows up, right? Mm-hmm. In a nice fl- frilly coat. 
Um, and uh, when, when does the ruse get, you know, because she's like, we bet all our money on you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. Butler, what have you done? You got yourself in so much trouble. Uh, and then, like, the butler finally just does it himself, right? He's yeah. just like, we weren't going to fucking, like, lose our title belt just to prove some point to you. Yeah. Right? Uh, that is that is an unsatisfying ending. Like, if they didn't have the final fight, that would be boring. Terrible. Well, not, it's just kind of, you know, yeah, it's a little... Sure. Uh, okay. Well, it's it, there's no, like, real triumph for Buster. It's right. It's just sort of like, right. he, you know, he gets out of it, and that's... That's it. What does his wife think? Like, what do what does everyone else think about that? It's just sort of right. It, it there's it, there's a, a kind of um, there it, there's something kind of beautiful about the ending being like he actually does need to defend his honor and like apply what he's learned, but yes. it's without the public spectacle of it. Right. He's not doing it for fame. He's not doing it for money. He's not doing it in the same way to like earn the respect of. Um, uh, and he's also uh, a not, public. He's, he's not doing, defeating he's, the Alabama murderer. He's right. doing it for himself. He's doing it for else. himself, right? Yeah. And he's beating a guy who, to be fair, literally just had a boxing match. Yeah. So it's sort of plausible that he might right, get right. one over. It him, is no, know? it is good, and and I I feel like this is the closest he comes in any of his movies to like breaking the stone face in this final dressing room fight, where you actual uh, you see real anger in him right and it's on quite his impassioned. face yes right and then he he treats this final fight seriously like it's right. it's pretty exciting to watch him actually hold his own against this guy he's picking the guy up and punching him back down yeah that's how that's how angry he gets. yeah he's really angry unfortunately the guy didn't bounce back up that would have been funny. i know yeah <laughs> <laughs> Did he ever smile in like a later movie in his like sort of non like did they ever do like the Garbo laughs thing with him where they're like, you know, we, we got Buster Keaton out of mothballs and he's gonna smile. I can't think of one, but that I haven't said I haven't seen all no, of the yeah. late I, stuff. I'm not really seeing anything. That just when I feels Google like it. a thing he was like just beyond firm about. Right. He knows. Did he ever smile? Like in life, yeah. Who knows? Maybe, yeah. Maybe he just couldn't work the muscles. I mean, there's a it, lot it of him stuff. Uh, just yeah, they they weren't formed. <laughs> yes. Right, right, right. They were like a baby's muscles. There's a lot of stuff JJ pulled up in in the general yeah. section yeah, of yeah, the yeah. dossier about how unbelievably uh, shy he was. Uh, the the leading lady from the general thought he was kind of like an aloof asshole on set because she was used to directors who were sort of louder and more domineering and movie stars who were more sort of gregarious and he was just kind of all business and she was like does he not like me is he like an asshole like everything was really blunt and it was like no it was just kind of like a job for him he was sort of unbearably shy he like worked with the same people most of the time because he was mostly only comfortable with the same group of people you know he wasn't a very social dude uh and i so i do think like i don't think he was uh uh, dour, but it's not right. like I think he was smiling he was a lot in his daily life and then just turning it off when he got on camera. Um, some other few, you know, that final fight is mm -hmm. kind of real. Yeah, they had boxers come in to train them. You know, they they'll punch it. The hits are kind of real. It's also it's a Buster thing where you're just watching it play out in a wide shot without cuts. So right. you're watching. You can tell it's not. They're fake. wailing on each other. Yeah, Martin Scorsese says the only person who had the right attitude about boxing in a movie for me was was Buster Keaton. Hey. I mean, that's, you know, just to, to, since we have talked about Jack Chan a little bit, I mean, that's sort of that approach to just filming action, just like yeah. keep it wide and show as much of the real thing as possible is still incredibly effective. That's why people, I mean, people love the first John Wick movie for a lot of reasons, but mm -hmm. half of what made that movie is so, I think, breathtaking for a lot of people is you have, would have these extended wide shots yes. of just Keanu fighting people. Right. And it, not really anything like that in American action cinema. Um, you'd have to like you'd have to look internationally to find action directors doing that kind of stuff. So, I mean that that fight at the end of Battling Butler, in a lot of ways, is like that's just how you should shoot a fight. Yes, right. That's like how you have to do it. Right. Point you don't overthink camera. it. You don't do anything stylish. You don't right. call attention to the filmmaking. I mean, it's also like you know, uh, it's the reason Jackie Chan movies are so famous for their blooper reels. Is like you know, for him, it's a statement. It's not just I want you to laugh at like the times the take went wrong. It's sort of like you've watched 
these takes that feel impossible. How could he have gotten this on camera? And the answer is, I did it 150 right, by times. by messing it up a bunch. Right. There's yeah. that, it, it, have you seen that thing, Jackie Chan, My Stunts? Yeah. That documentary, which is incredible. That's him sort of like guiding the audience through his whole approach to stunt work and filmmaking, going through some of his best sequences. But he's got this great line where he says, like, people always say, Jackie good, Jackie good. And he's like, Jackie not good. Jackie just do it a hundred times until he gets it right. <laughs> right, for sure. You know, he's like, I, I, I get it wrong 99 times until it, the one take. It's also, that's part of the buster thing. These movies took a very long time to make. Yes. Uh, especially compared to the production schedules of the time. Like, he would take right. months on these films. Uh, yes. Because he would, you know, work very hard to get it right. Yeah. Uh, he did fall on his head from the practice ring. Uh, and was taken out for a few days. Uh, he strained ligaments in his leg and back. Uh, he, as usual, he just kind of like got the shit beaten out of him making this movie. It was a gigantic hit. Mm -hmm. Made about a quarter of a million dollars, which is a lot of money back then. And this is a, a simpler, cheaper movie on his sort of oscillation between. Uh, you know, I think he always tried to keep his budgets under control as much as he could. But then when his movies became more vehicle based, uh, 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 right? The, well, that's the cost other, balloon in a way he couldn't control. Also, like you know, the next film, The General, is yeah. United Artists. This is the last like Metro MGM sort right. of like you know back in the day, uh, because Charles Skank has signed this big deal with United Artists. Joe Skank, not yes. Charles, Jesus, his manager, his producer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is where things will get balloon. Should we do the box office game for Battling Butler now? Yes. Great. Great. Thank you. Do you have any uh, uh, final battling butler thoughts, Jamel? No final battling butler thoughts. It's fun. Other it's, it's than the that, I, you know. I enjoyed it. It was yeah. a good. It was a good time. A good, fun time. We all had a nice time with the battling butler, and now let's look at the box office game for September eighteenth, nineteen twenty six. Okay. Uh, so you 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 basically know what this you know what this is right, Griff? Like you know these movies. I know these movies right really well. Yeah, and all that. Um, and this is before I'm trying to think. So like, it chapter one is the first September to release to make over a hundred million dollars <laughs> opening week. Right. So, so I it's not know that. the number would be below. 100. No, I'm not even seeing it on this list here, but that doesn't really mean much. Okay. Uh, okay so number one at the box office mm -hmm. is a film okay it's a film okay interesting uh, that's a looks good like hint. a drama a drama produced by famous players uh okay uh, released by paramount pictures and it's not a title you recognize no uh it stars renee adore oh what a name yeah uh, i'm gonna guess this movie is called actress hmm? i'm gonna uh, guess this film is called uh uh au revoir amour uh, no, it's not. Uh, so it's Rene Adore and okay. Thomas Megan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, there's not even anything about the plot of this movie, so that's all I got for you. It seems to be based on a play or something. It's called Tin Gods. That's a good title. Not a bad title. No. Um, T tin or tan? Tin. T -I -N. Tin, tin. Tin Gods. So I don't know if they work in like some kind of industry. Aluminium? I, don't, I just don't know. I mean, but they're Tin Gods. What's it called? Later. Aluminium Gods in... <laughs> It's just the Brits say aluminium and you guys say aluminum. It's the same sort of elemental substance that you're referring yeah, I to. I know. I just want All right. to accept the joke logic. It's of cartoon. Course. It's a cartoon gag. Absolutely. The next film has a really good title. Right? It's a lost film. It's Doesn't a lost film. Anymore. It's a comedy also from famous players in Paramount. Oh. stars B.B. Daniels and directed by the great Clarence Badger. And you said it has I a great... love these names. Incredible. You said it has a great title? Yeah. I'm going to guess it's called, Hey, Fuck You, Man. <laughs> okay, I got to guess too. Please. Honk, honk. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you this. It's a college film. Okay. And the, uh, the, the, the lead is a woman and she's... The poster is her and she's got like a sweater tied around her neck. Uh, and she seems to be holding some like cleats, you know, some kind of footwear. And she's... She's winking. Is it like a woman in school? <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like that. It's called <laughs> Mrs. Student. <laughs> it's called The Campus Flirt. You know well, what? I was close. Oh, I was close. You were very close. close. This sounds like the the Marco Robbie Babylon movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like yeah. uh oh, like yeah. you all know BB Daniels, and I'm like, uh, sure. And yeah. like, well, she's going to college. We know she flirts at a bar, but what happened if she went to college? <laughs> Number three, okay, um, is a silent feature-length drama. Mm -hmm. uh, did not ha well. 
I call it a silent film because it doesn't okay. have any dialogue, but it was actually the first film to use the Vitaphone sound on disc sound system. So it had a synchronized score okay. and sound effects. Okay. So it actually had, like if you watched it today, sure. it had you know, yeah, yeah. the same music. Yeah. Uh, it's based on a famous epic tale, a poem. Okay. Uh, and it stars the legendary John Barrymore, one of the most famous actors uh, is it, in is history. It a, is it a Beowulf adaptation? No. But something good, like Beowulf! that? Beowulf! Is it a hmm, hmm. famous epic tale? Famous epic can, you, can you give us a century in which wrote, this epic tale was written? Yeah, it's the, from the 19th century. So it's not like a classical epic tale. It is a romantic poem, a is long it, romantic poem. Is it poem. The Wasteland? No, that <laughs> would be amazing if that had been uh, popping on yeah. Hollywood screens. Um, it is Don Juan, Don Juan, ah, yeah. oh. Byron's tale. Uh, so when, starring a so big when John you say, probably really popping off. I when you say it had like synced uh, Vitaphone, Vitaphone uh, sound effects, it yeah. was just like sex noises, kissing. Right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as it puts it here, John, John Barrymore is the hand kissing womanizer. <laughs> Have you seen like you know 20th century or whatever, like later John Barrymore movies? Grand Hotel, yes, probably. yes. Like he is the most actor. He's yes. just like <laughs> yes. screaming. You're yes. just like, okay, buddy, I get it. Yeah. So I imagine it's quite, you know. You think he went big playing Don Juan, the world's most famous lover? Quite big, yes. Yeah. All right, number four. Okay. I just love looking up these movies. Uh, is called, well, I'm not going to tell you what it's called. It's another lost film, mm. silent comedy, starring Gilda Gray as okay. an erotic dancer. She mm. was a famous actress known for popularizing a dance called The Shimmy. Hey. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah. David just did a little shimmy in little the studio. Shimmy. It's from mm -hmm. Maurice Turner. Okay. Uh, French director of some renown, mm -hmm. and uh, it's called. I'm gonna guess it's called the Shimmy. Mm. That'd be good. Yeah, uh, it's called Aloma of the South Seas. We we, we used to have titles <laughs> in this country. We got we got well we got through all the good ones in 1920s. This is the problem, you know. Let's dust some of them off. I, seriously. Well, like how about this one? A silent comedy, romantic comedy. Mm. Norma Shearer is the star. You probably heard of her. Oh yeah. The divorcee herself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she plays a lawyer in okay. the 20s. Yeah. Who uh, is resented by a guy lawyer. Mm -hmm. uh, and she gets a acquittal for a man chasing widow and defeats said widow in romancing the guy. That seems to be the. You it's know, a lot of plot. On, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's called. What's it called? It's called. I sue you. Uh, it's, it's called She Can Have It All. <laughs> she can have it all. It's called The Waning Sex. Wow. So I assume sort of a joke about like, oh, girls rule, boys drool. Yeah, right, yeah, right. I mean, 20s, yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. Right. I mean, you know, the classic 1920s woke agenda. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The mind <laughs> MCU. virus. The mind virus has got him. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you've also got you got Ben Hur, which I think we talked about before, the sure. original classic. Still blowing up the box. Office. Uh, you yeah. got something called Mare Nostrum, uh, which is like I think a, you know um, Roman epic or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the one I want to look up: a movie called Blarney. Mm -hmm. Ben, does that ben? sound fun? Ben Blarney, like Blarney Stone. It's about an Irish prize fighter who gets involved with two New York girls. Hey. Oh, okay. And uh -oh. he he's got to pick one. It has everything we love. Girls fighting and ethnic minorities. Yes, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Ben's so. been feeling very uh, persecuted across this miniseries as he realizes how much of this era of film was just making fun of Irish oh, people. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, the Irish, are they human? Who knows? <laughs> It's right by the twenties. They're sort of like, well, they're here to stay, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we can't constantly <laughs> mock them. <laughs> I mean, there's the picture of Little Buster dressed up. Yes, as... have you seen Little Buster dressed as an Irishman when he was uh, uh, like five years no, old? No, I know I haven't. No, have you sorry. seen those photos of like the stage act, the Keaton family, where he's got the weird like receding hairline bald wig on? Yes, that is, this is supposed an to Irishman. Be an Irishman in quotes. <laughs> That's what that getup is. I mean, okay, so we we joke, but like in 1910s, during mm -hmm. the First World War in the United States, when the Wilson administration was basically arresting dissidents, like one thing, if you were like happened to be a little too enthusiastic about Irish independence because we were allies with the British, oh, that could get yeah. you thrown in jail. Wow. It, it, it's just so funny to think of a time where like America was taking this stance of like, there's a type of Anglo-Saxon male we don't like. Amen. Came well, to New York, one baby. of them in a corner. As we transition to the general, Jamal's yes. going to get more historian-y. Please. And 
I mean, the interesting thing is that, like, part of the relationship of Ireland to Great Britain is that, like, the Irish were, like, quite racialized. So, like, not necessarily understood sure. as being Anglo-Saxon. Right. They're, like, something right. else. I mean, right. Yeah. At that time, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what's wild to think about. Yes. Um, yeah, no, for sure. Because uh, it must, as much as it was about a religion differences... They also really though made it like racial, right? Right. Yeah, it's it's right. sort of like it's, like it's, they are stupider for us because we decided they are, right? Like, right. You know, inherently. Right. Yeah. Right. You you can see in sort of like the development of Ireland's relationship to England, mm -hmm. like uh, the process of racialization take place over centuries. And there's actually like there's a good there's an argument that has been made that like the the colonial relationship of Ireland to the UK is basically the first instance of that kind of, like, racialized colonial That's interesting. In, uh, relationship. I will say, as someone who grew up in England, it is crazy how it is still baked in that you're, like, people are suspicious of red-headed people. You know, and they're like, that's like a dirty ginger. And you're like, why do we what? hate this guy? And I go home, and my mom's like, that's like fucking, you know, Irish. That's 1,000 years of Irish shit. Like, yeah. Damn. It's like the kids don't even think about that, obviously, because like it's not on there. But like she's like, that's all that is. It's just like that Irish and Scotch people, you know, with their red hair, their fiery red hair can't be trusted. And you're, you can't be trusted, Ben. You can't. You have to admit well, it. Well, look, we're well, not stereotyping here, but it is a fact that Ben can't be trusted. Uh, yeah, ben, I, and I'll accept that. Not only do I love the Irish people, yes. but I support Irish independence. And uh, As do I? You know. But you also think Ben can't be trusted. No, Ben can be trusted. <laughs> he can be trusted. Ben gets the episodes posted week after week. It's very He's the true. most trustworthy man That's a good I know. Point. Um, this show would be eight years on a hard drive if Ben didn't exist. Yes. There would not have been one episode yet released for the public. Um, the thing... The, Fucking Woodrow Wilson, man. Mm. Oh, yeah. What's the matter with that guy? Like, when I was a kid, I think I had this, like, just, I'm sorry to do this. As, as I've gotten, I gotta, do I gotta, as I've read I more and more Eddie history. Brock right now. What's and the I feel matter like, with Wilson, that what's guy? What's your deal with that guy? What's your problem? I feel like you were just tweeting about Wilson's <laughs> effect on, his effect on, like, the sort of, quote, unquote, like, hard left <laughs> in society back then, right? right, right like, uh -huh. he was obviously the hero of liberalism and, like, the first Democratic president, blah, 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 you know, like, and... But like when I was a kid, I was like, yeah, that was like a good guy, right? He was like, he his, believed his, in a social safety net, and he well, the League of Nations. Edith and all Wilson these things, was a right? very influential post First Lady, and right. did a lot of work to basically sort of like sustain his reputation. Right. Liberal historians in the 20th century, really, you know, beginning of the administrative state, the progressive era. It's really, I mean, there have been there have always been dissenters to this view, right. but it's really been in the last like generation yeah. where people have taken much more seriously, not just Wilson's racism, which he was like, it's his man of his time. Wilson was a weird racist. No, he was for, for the time. He was like super racist for the time. People right. like he was unusually so <laughs> right like at, at the, at the, uh, at the Paris negotiations at the end of the war, like other European heads of state were like, it's really weird how racist and this those guy guys is. were so racist. Like they were <laughs> colonial leaders. Uh, they were carving up continents. Those guys. <laughs> So it's like it's not just his unusual racism, but like the Wilson administration kind of set up a police state. Like yeah. people were getting thrown into jail. There's one story. This is uh, I, re I recently read Adam Hothschild's uh, most recent book, American Midnight, which is all about this period Ooh. of U.S. history. And there's a crazy story of like three Polish immigrant dudes in a shoe shop just talking. I think maybe they were German immigrants, and one of them was like, you know, you know, Ludendorff, the German, the German uh, uh, general. You know, he's you know. He's a he's a good guy, you know. Right. Germany, they're not doing good stuff. But Ludendorff <laughs> was a good guy. A customer overheard. He was nice this. to me. <laughs> sure, right, right. Overheard he this. Certainly enjoys his social life. Yes, <laughs> yeah. the authorities, and all three guys got arrested and like sentenced to like ten years in jail. Like they weren't just getting like thrown in the jail for six months. Sort of like, oh, you are talking bad about the Wilson, or yeah. you're talking good about Germany. What's that? What's that? Uh, uh, uh what's his name? Um, Fred Armisen, straight mm -hmm. to jail. Mm -hmm. straight oh, to jail, right. Right. direct to jail. Yes. Uh, so, <laughs> and that's like that. That part of Wilson was um really downplayed right. in sort of popular memory for a long time. But then when you read about it and you really you re you read things like you know prior 1912 the Socialist Party wins like you know two million votes right. huge numbers is like electing Congress people electing governors and everything. 
and then six years later barely exist. Right. And it's like that's that's the Wilson administration. That's just what that is. That motherfucker. Yeah, he sucks. He sucks. I want to like give that coarse face an uppercut. <laughs> he really had a very long face. He had kind of a bustery face, very long and thin yeah. face, old Woody. And the other thing is like but I small. thought of him as like, oh yeah, he was this like genteel Princeton dude. And it's like, no, he was like a southerner right. who had made it up to the north and like you know was actually but he's, not like, he very looks like a skull and bones Jersey. club motherfucker. He does. He does have he does, that air. Yeah. yeah. He um he uh he is not just it's not just that he screened just to Wilson's southernness and his racism, it's not just that he screened Birth of a Nation at the White House, but right. that he is and quoted in Birth of a Nation. History written by in Lightning or whatever. That's his big quote. Wait, right? he yelled Birth of a Nation? <laughs> he screamed it. <laughs> Birth of a Nation! <laughs> Until they showed it to him. In the screening room. Yeah. No, he's quoted in the movie. Um, oh, as wow. sort of like, yeah. No, he's being like, I like this. Yeah. Like, this or, no, no, good. no. <laughs> just sort of like about sort of how you know, Reconstruction was like a horrible thing that happened to the country. I, 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 uh, a friend of mine, uh, Colin, who's an old friend, a listener of the show, uh, and is far more academic about film history than I am an idiot. Uh, uh, I was taught... Wait, is this Colin I know? Yes. I didn't know he listened. Yeah. Hey, Colin. Yeah. Um, but uh, we were talking about in the uh, Three Ages episode how that movie is... Buster parodying intolerance, uh, uh, D.W. Griffith's uh, sort of uh, cor correction movie to Birth of a Nation criticism, and I was sort of making the point of like uh, th that that existed back then, right? right? Like that people, you know, anytime anyone is getting mad about any piece of pop culture being quote unquote politicized, there's this sort of argument of like, why can't you just let people enjoy stuff? Mm, things right, didn't used right. to have to be read into and like weaponized in and this what, kind and, of way. And Woodrow Wilson did say that in his State of the Union. Once. Absolutely, let people enjoy things. Right. Um, a, a famously smooth brain, Woodrow Wilson. Um, <laughs> All right, the general. But no, but my my point was, oh, sure. you know, Colin sort of was like, you're right that there was pushback to it, but like the pushback was the minority. Yeah, sure. as as proven by yeah, the fact Birth that like Nation was a big hit. the sitting president was just like this fucking movie. Get your eyes on this thing, and it's you know, it's these things are connected because. Uh, uh, Buster basically credits Birth of a Nation as the movie that made him see the value in filmmaking as a medium. Right, sure. Which is part of Birth of a Nation's weird fucking legacy. Is it's sort of like... Technically virtuous. virtuous. But not even that. It's just like film language being synthesized with a clarity and a scale for the first time to like her fucking horrendous means, which is so much of, uh, I don't know, like the the weird DNA of film history is like... It was used so much to perpetuate narratives to, uh, you know, as forms of propaganda or, uh, you know, history trying to be written enlightening by by those in the positions of power or what have you. Right. Um, all of this tied into the general is like, you know, Buster, I think, was uh, tried to uh, define himself as a apolitical artist. You know, I don't yeah. think he ever would have made a movie there like... There is not a lot of politics in his work. No, and he had no ambition to make something like The Great Dictator, right? right? Like, there was no bone in his body that was ever going to make a film that ends with a fucking eight-minute monologue that's a direct plea to the audience against fascism. Right. I think he viewed that kind of thing as... Well, who knows? I mean, like... Preachy. Sure, but who knows, who knows how he would have felt in the mid-30s when, you know, he wasn't really making movies anymore and things were getting hot. But yes. I don't know. I have no idea. I mean, yes. But he's, he sees Birth of a Nation, and it's sort of like setting this template of a thing to to riff upon, right? They also, a lot of the stuff J.J. brought up in his research is like, it was very documented that Keaton had this weird fascination with the sort of reputation of the South in the early 1900s. These sort of like... Uh, 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 what's what's the term I'm looking for? The lost cause, yes, sort, sort of, of south, thing. right? Yes. But but sort of the manners of it, it, weirdly, without him having like any direct family ties to that. That's not where he grew up. They were like you know even the times that the Keaton family played in the South were basically only during the worst years of the family dynamic yes. before his mother well, it was left a very his father. Poor part of the country. I mean, Jamel. Yes. You can probably, you know, give some context on that too. Like, you know, in the nineteen teens, nineteen twenties, the South is still pretty fucked up. 
Yes, it's still very poor. You have to remember that it's basically it's heavily agricultural, heavily rural, and you know most Southerners, white and black, are working, um, sort of doing like agricultural labor for very low wages. Uh, it's 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 and there's like way less of any kind of social safety. Now. Like the the country is not really helping that much. Right. 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 Yeah. right. And and there's something to like, uh, and obviously huge systemic racism, right? Buster is such a modern man, right? He's yeah. like growing up a city boy, placed into like a career at his youngest possible ages, yeah. surrounded by like drinking adults. Sure, I think there must have been something really fascinating to him about like what he viewed as some sort of uh, I don't know uh, a, a relative tranquility. Right. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, like maybe. this is a slower life. These are people of manners. There's less of this sort I of. I think there was a lot of that generally, right? And also right. just the nostalgia that every like era has for other eras, like all the time of like right. ah things were different. Then. Right. You know, like that people can slip into this very easy. And they were the of... biggest proponents of things used to be different. Ah, because if you're growing up in all cities right. like he was, the city people are all looking forward. They're yeah. like, what if we built a this? What if we built a what? I'm saying fill in the blank. They're trying to build things. David. Yes. People talk about streaming services. You hear about them? The streaming services? They do be talking about the streaming services. When I look at them, I feel like there are dams constructed in the middle of these streams. Uh, okay. These streams aren't running free and forceful. No, okay, fine. Streams are being diverted, cut off at the pass. You know why? Why? Because there are thousands of titles on Netflix that you're not allowed to watch. Because your IP address. Um, sure. You don't see them because Netflix gives you different shows depending on what country you're in. So what you see on Netflix here is completely different than what someone in Italy or South Korea sees. Let's see. Well, what about if I have like an ExpressVPN? Well, then that's the solution. Yes. Then that solves the problem. Then that, that's a damn buster, if you will. Uh, like uh, they've got like 90 countries to choose from. Mm -hmm. So every time you run out of stuff to watch... Uh, I can switch to another country to unlock new shows. Yeah, here's a very Griffin problem. I've been buying more steel books from foreign countries. Yes. And then I get the digital download codes, which I can't redeem because they're set for a different country. Right. So what do I do? ExpressVPN, clicky clicky. Uh, that's the thing. Redeem Look, it, go back. They have a Sent whole up library. I you know, they have a whole grid you can check out. Yes. That, uh, you know, can show you, like, the kind of shows you've been watching elsewhere yeah. in the world. Uh -huh. Could use it to watch Taskmaster. Your favorite show. Which is hard to watch in this country yes. if you don't have a VPN. Yes. Well, we live in a broken country. We do. Yeah, we do. And, that, and that's, that's the, number the one sign reason. of why. That's the number one reason. Um, but look, you can also use it to get discounts. Some mm -hmm. services cost less than other countries. Yeah. You could buy Netflix from Argentina for a fraction of the price. That's a real workaround. Argentinian Netflix. Uh, at the less than $7 a month, ExpressVPN pays for itself and so much more. So it's, it's a no-brainer. No if you want to get way more shows and save money while you're at it, go to expressvpn.com slash check. Don't forget to use my link so you can get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash check, expressvpn.com slash check to learn more. Break down that dam. Uh this book called Daring and Suffering mm -hmm. um where is uh is one thing that he's thinking about making after Battling Butler, but then Clyde Bruckman, mm -hmm. who I wonder, you know, so, you know, that's a character, that obviously that's a big Keaton contributor. He, sure. He worked on a lot of Keaton movies. Mm -hmm. It's the name of one of the great um, uh, X-Files one-off episodes. I don't, you're not an X-Files guy, right? No, there's an episode called Clyde Bruckman? It's called Clyde Bruckman's Final Repose, and it stars Peter Boyle. He won an Emmy for it. Okay. Um, it's a Darren Morgan written episode. It's, In my opinion, I think it is the single best episode of television ever made. Interesting. Like, uh, and a lot of people don't even think it's the best X-Files episode, but I do. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, I just have to assume it has to be a Buster Keaton homage, uh, right? That he's named that? Like Darren Morgan. Yeah. Who's the guy who wrote it? Who is sort of a legendary um, uh, X Files writer? Must have been. He seems like the kind of guy who would have loved Buster Keaton. But uh, so Clyde Bruckman is the guy who brings Keaton this book called The Great Locomotive Chase. Okay. That is the tale of this, you know, real military raid. Yes. In Georgia during the Civil War, where volunteers from the Union Army like commandeered this train called the General and took it to Tennessee. And we're just fucking shit up as they went. You know, it was like this crazy 
uh, you know, barnstorming, like, uh, train raid. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, an action-packed thing. Right. And he kind of looks at that the same way he looked at the, um, whatchamacallit, uh, the battling butler premise of just like, oh, within this. The train. This this, train is great. Right. Right. We, We can do all kinds of things around this as it's moving. And yeah, yeah. Yes. Right. I mean, the train is great. You think I'm going to come on this episode and be like, this train stinks. Dude, I'm like, I'm like all in on this train. I'm like, we should have these trains now. It's basically just a friggin' fireplace <laughs> that you drive. Oh, oh, wait, I'm sorry. You're just in on steam trains. Yeah. Because you're like, I the like idea. that they're on fire. Yeah. I think it, uh, that looks like a fucking blast. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's kind of hot. David, a little balmy. Ben and I went to. Mm, I don't know though. I think it would be fun. What did you do? What fun thing did you? We do? went to see Guardians of the Galaxy Volume That's, Three and Four DX. Yes. yes and the trailer for Pixar's Elemental came up, Ugh. and uh, that was my response. And I said, Ben, I think this movie looks like shit. I think it looks it fucking does. garbage. And Ben is sort of like looking. Uh, uh, we're seeing the trailer in 40x, so we're getting sprayed a lot in the face with water. Right? <laughs> That's not a movie we're to see in 40x. At, no, it's, that movie <laughs> is going to blow out the systems. The circuit board at 40x theaters is going to catch on fire during those screenings. But we're watching this trailer, and I'm sort of sitting there, like rolling my eyes and whatever. And I'm looking at Ben, and Ben's sort of tilting his head. And then he looks to me, and he was like, "So is the premise of this movie?" What if fire met water? And I was <laughs> like, oh, fuck. This is I a mean, movie. Like fire and water. Yeah. Opposites attract. Right. Sure. He's like, oh, it's like dry and wet trying to fall in love. And I was like, this is a Ben premise. This is what Ben would go into Pixar and pitch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, but it does actually kind of look like dog shit. It, it does. just looks bad. Like, <laughs> yeah. I hate how it visually. <laughs> yeah. All right. So they, they bring him this story. Keaton's like, well, look, I mean, there's a lot of plot here. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be laughs. Everyone around him also kind of warns him where they're like, are you really going to build a movie on top of the Civil War? I understand the thing that you think is funny here and like in the premise and is like exciting to tackle as a director. But like audiences might just turn off at the idea that you are trying to put jokes into a movie about based around War. a bunch right. of people dying. And not only that, about a real thing that happened in the Civil War. Right. Like not not even just a generally sort of no, set during but the it's war. like an yeah. interesting counterpoint to think about today when like the only comedies we get are action comedies where everyone's getting shot in the face. Yes. And you become desensitized to it. And it's sure. all like Looney Tunes violence where you don't really think about people dying. And at this, at this time, people were like terrified at the notion of like, you cannot make a movie that it, it purports itself to be a comedy. Yeah, well, maybe. on top of actual human suffering that's, and tragedy. That's why Keaton takes such pride in this film. Yes. He figured the minute you give me a locomotive, this is the quote, well, the moment you give me a locomotive and things like that to play with, as a rule, I'll find some way of getting laughs with it. Yes. Um, but he likes that they took a real life story, paid very careful attention to, you know, like the sort of procedure of it. Mm hmm. And represented it on screen, even though they've changed massive like parts about it, but whatever. Well, here's the single biggest thing. Mm-hmm. Did In, you know that Disney made a movie called The Great Locomotive Chase? That's also have you seen it? No, I've never seen it. I didn't Nobody realize it existed it. until today. Uh, um so. Buster was talking greasy about it. He said it fucking sucked. Um the big quote, you're queuing this up, I might as well just read it. Yeah. He told the story from a northerner's standpoint. Well, the his leaning man's northerner, it's awfully hard. For a motion picture audience, for some reason, to make heroes out of the Northerners. Right. So in, in real life, I and guess it's in essentially the book, a sort of a thinking of like, well, you don't want to make fun of the losers. They already that lost. That was his attitude. That's right? the part of it that makes the most sense is he was like, well, if I if I switch the allegiances and make my character a Southerner, he becomes low status, which is inherent to right. the Buster persona. He needs to be the guy who's fighting against the odds, and we know how history turned out. So if I have him on the winning side, it already throws off the power balance of the thing. Yes. But it is an odd choice. Um, Jamel, this is where I sort of turn to you in terms of, like, I guess, was there just not... Because, like, you could think, like, oh, yeah, a jingoistic movie about how we won the Civil War. Like how, you know, the Union won the Civil War. Yeah. Would that not go over? Was there just no sympathy... Or no particular kind of, like, triumphalism about that in the 1920s, or maybe not enough, I guess. So it's not even, okay. It's also just, like, a horrible war. Like, that's its legacy is 
beyond anything else, it's just like, it sucked. It was the worst. Right. He also, by the way, like, I, like I, I want to he- I I hear your answer, but the yeah. other quote in here that was interesting is he, you know, because Buster was just like, the number one thing I serve is the audience, and I want to make the audience laugh. That is my primary job. And he was like, I watch movies that make fun of Southerners and they die. They die in the theater. Sure. Right. He was There's like, some it just seems comedically here, yes. impossible for whatever reason. So... 1920s, the, the mid 1920s is 10 years after the half century anniversary of the end of the Civil War. So, in okay. 1915, it's 50 years since it's Appomattox. There's actually a big called Blue and Gray kind of reunion. They have them across the country. There's a big one in DC. President Wilson goes and speaks before it. And motherfucker, he's back. <laughs> and the key, the key thing is that. This the con the, the political context and cultural context is one of like sectional reconciliation. It's mm-hmm. not so much that there's no appetite for doing stuff about the war, but the 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 uh, consensus position among white Americans is the war was a terrible tragedy. The brother aftermath- against brother, yeah, brother right. against brother. Right. Uh, the aftermath was an even greater tragedy, Reconstruction. Sure. Uh, and we need to put all of that behind us and kind of recognize that both sides were brave. Both bo- sides fought with valor. Right. And that's the thing we're going to honor. And, and 50 so- years on, you would still know veterans of the Civil War exactly. and your families, things like that. Was yeah. there not also a bit of a thing, a sort of abstraction that that was, I, you know, I think uh, uh, constructed and manipulated of like what the war was over yeah, absolutely. The, this they, reframing they that was that. happening sure. in States real rights. time of right, right, just right, like right. right. So yeah, it's 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 the 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 cause of the conflict is abstracted away from the specific conflicts of which slavery is sort of like the thing on which they arrest. The facts are not being suppressed, but the language around it is constantly sort of being right. massaged. It's abstracted yeah. into well, this was a conflict over you know whether it was possible to secede. Whether or not state, I mean, obviously we, we all know the language of states' rights and that kind of thing. But that was like less of a, a part here than it simply was. I mean, there's like a there's an even larger context here that this is the begin early 20th century is the beginning of a imperial America, right? Sure. This is we are we have our occupation in the Philippines, we have the invasion of Haiti, we have an occupation in Central America. Like this is when the United States is becoming a an imperial power. And so part of what's happening politically is there is – in order to unite the public around – which when this begins in the 1890s is still – the Civil War is still fresh in everyone's memory for right. the most part. In order to unite the public, we have to reconcile. We have to come to some agreement about what the war was about mm-hmm. and kind of end the political and cultural conflict over it. Sure. So the solution to that is – is you know for lack of a better term it's like it's white supremacy it's sort of well we're all white here and we're, we we have a destiny to conquer the continent and we have a destiny to expand beyond our borders and so that's what we're going to do and we can recognize that our forefathers who fought in the war were all you know they were all of good faith and good nature and this was just a tragic thing that happened and we can put it past us and so I w- it makes total sense that in the context of making a film mm-hmm. and making a comedy, um, it's not just that like you got to sell stuff to southern audiences, and so you don't want to you don't want to you know turn them off, but also that there's been kind of like a collective agreement among white Americans that we're gonna treat the South as being noble and honorable, right? And so it's it's it would it would kind of like cut against that collective agreement. To then do a movie where it's the reverse, whereas you can, you can present the union as being, you know, less so. Yeah. Um. Uh. uh not because there aren't union veterans around, right? Mm-hmm. There's a. I think Oliver Wendell Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes is still alive, so he is a Supreme Court justice, and he was a union soldier. So you still union veterans are still very much alive and, and even in public life, but, um. Uh. The the North. I put it this way. Yeah. There's this discomfort in the cultural discomfort with industrialization and like the consequences of that culture in the United States in the 1910s and 20s. Mm-hmm. And so the industrializing North itself occupies a different cultural space than it might have a couple decades earlier, right? Like it can kind of be the bad guy. Well, right. Because there, of all this yes. collective discomfort with sort of like, you know, 
modern life. Right, which then becomes, you talk about the abstraction of the thing, the philosophical battle of are we losing some sort of uh, 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 genteel nobility, grace, courtesy, uh, a, a culture of manners right. and tradition, and that's what abstracting the, the things that that was built on versus here's this bustling city life and modernism coming in and tearing up everything and making a crasser society. And that's winning, by the way. So there's a sort of like punching up versus punching down thing of, well, you can poke that balloon. Right, because exactly. Because that is unstoppable. Right. It is It is a, a locomotive. It is steamrolling which, ahead. Which is sort of interesting. I mean, that's kind of the interesting kind of like tension about the, the, the whole motif here is yeah. that like the train, the railroad literally does represent modernization. Right. When you tell the story of industrialization in the late 19th century United States, you're in a lot of ways telling the story of railroads right. and the expansion of railroads across the country, the extent to which railroads were sort of like the driving, the driving engine, no pun intended, of like the expansion of Northern capital across the country. And so like in the original story, both because of actual events, but just thinking thematically, it makes sense that this would be the North. Like that makes sure. all the more sense, right? right? right. Like, and a locomotive getting um, uh, 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 taken by your opponents makes all the more thematic sense. Like you representing this engine of progress yeah. and your enemies who will represent an agrarian backwards society right. have like seized that from you. So there's like this funny way in which like the inversion makes sense given the the politics of the era. Yeah. But then it kind of just like makes the the themes of the story kind of like throws them out of whack that's somewhat. the thing because you almost want to go like is there something subversive to even though he's flipping the politics of the actual story to then placing the buster keaton comedic persona in the position of the person trying to help the confederacy right but the movie doesn't quite right. and i should yeah. say so here's here's the other thing to kind of clue you in on sort of like the the political and cultural context here the movie never refers to the confederacy the movie right, says right. No. the south the you south. see a flag right that's, yes. that's basically it obviously there's not much discussion of the values being fought over right no, right yes it says yes. the south which right. yes. which can stand for honor and gentility right, right. and which is all, all which are all the things that the other characters are embodying that like buster keaton wants to also embody by enlisting and and becoming right um, a soldier in this way we're talking about like the the confederate or not the confederate the southern soldier as this movie frames it is like the boxer in battling butler yeah exactly this type this role this costume yeah. of modern masculinity of social capital of respect that he wants to figure out how to wear right. but as is always the case in buster movies he doesn't quite understand what the thing he's pretending to be is you know, um, he's barely got this grasp on it. And this movie is just like, we're not even going to talk about what they actually right. are or what they're standing for. And I should say, I mean, like, from our perspective, like, the fact that they're they're not talking about it might seem like, oh, we're purposely avoiding it. But you really have to think of it as, like, no one's even thinking about it. Right. Like, there's, there's in the beginning, when the, a train's being unloaded, you see some black laborers. I think it's yeah. the only time you see black people in the movie. And... It's not it's not like we're gonna deliberately exclude black people from the narrative. Just like this was reconciliation among among white Americans. Like it it wasn't black people were out of sight, out of mind. It's part part of the function of something like Jim Crow right. was essentially to put you do what you want. They're out of sight, out of mind right. for the rest of us. Well, like right. uh, not to not to open up a, a conversational quarter that's absolutely going to make David roll his eyes audibly. Oh boy, <laughs> it's a horrible setup. But okay. does this not feel like an echo of this thing we're going through right now, where it's just like the insane? David put his head down on the desk. I don't want to talk about this for a while, but but I'm trying to like understand the perspective of when this movie's coming out, right? And I feel some echo in the sort of like. The like the sinister brilliance of make America great again as like a statement that says everything and means nothing at the same sure. time where you're like the idea of what they're fighting for is like we lost sight of leave it to beaver. That's what America used to be it's in the same way you're rewriting. Way. That's course. always been the dog. So whistle. you come up with like, some like sometimes it works and sometimes it fictionalized doesn't. Right. abstracted version of the past that you're fighting for. And you're just sort of conveniently ignoring the reality happening right outside the boundaries of the frame. 
Um, yeah, but right, but it, it's more like it's like when does it resonate to be like you know things were better back then, and right. it's like what was better? What yeah. are you talking about? But, like, and it's like well, well you can figure fence. that out. You know? I feel like right. that like argument with when it comes to toilet paper for me. <laughs> You see, this is I'm where like, I'm like, that's where Trump, toilet papers, the like, I need that. And but like, for toilet paper, it's not good. Look, sure, not to talk about sure. Donald Trump and we can cut this out, but like, that is like the magic of Donald Trump is that sometimes, such as when he'll be like, you know, showers don't have the kind of water pressure they used to. Yeah. You have this sort of twin reaction of like, what on earth is he talking? Like, why would he be saying this at like a political rally? Right. And you're also like, He's not wrong, though. You know, showers do kind of suck. Well, it's also, days. like anyone who comes out and <laughs> toilets don't flush like these. But also, to. anyone who comes out and stands against him, you're like, this guy's pro <laughs> shittier water pressure. It's a position that no one wants to embody. Well, you know, you got to conserve water or whatever. But right. uh, yeah, no, anyway, it's just sometimes you'll tap into something where you're like, yeah, things were better back when. And then you're like, wait a second, what is the matter with me? Why? But I'm, I'm also like, I'm not trying to apologize for his viewpoint, right? But it's this thing JJ was bringing up that like all these biographers are like, it was weird how much he was kind of fascinated by the South as just like a culture, right? Mm. Like apolitically. And it does sort of make sense where it's like, here's this guy who was thrown into an adult world really young in a really brash, really rapid, really aggressive way, right? Mm -hmm. And then he goes to this place where everyone's like, well, let's just sit in a rocking chair and talk yeah, about sure. the good old days. Yeah, yeah. You, know? it's, you can romanticize these things. Right. With, I, I think it, there's some energy that he finds romantic there, but also part of it is possibly just him feeling like he works for the audience and perhaps the the South is less willing to laugh at themselves than the North is. I can make a comedy where the North is the butt of the joke. I've done it before, you know, and sure. no one bristles. I mean, the other thing is just that, like, that romance of the South is just like a part of American culture, right? Yes. Like, so Birth of a Nation, again, that's 1915, but it's based off of a book by Thomas Dixon called The Klansman, mm -hmm. which is 1905, I think, 1906, around that time. And that's like it's like a romantic it's a romantic uh, tale uh, of uh, of a Confederate, um, the Virginian. One of the first westerns as a novel mm -hmm. is about an ex Confederate. the 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 romantic the romanticized loser basically sort of like the loser again. And this all this all ties into sort of industrializing America. That mm -hmm. like the country is. It's, I mean, it's already be becoming rapidly industrialized at the close of the 19th century. But really, by the 10s and 20s, it's like abundantly clear that this is where we're going. This is what the country is. Right. There are cities and there are cars and there are – we've witnessed this horrible war, mechanized war um, uh, across the ocean. This is where we are now. And so the the, the Confederate South represents – sort of what we left behind mm -hmm. in like a in like a, the most literal sense right sort of the, the 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 destruction of the confederacy and the end of chattel slavery did destroy an entire social system yeah and in 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 the kind of the romantic imagination that social system was very genteel it was like gentlemen and beautiful homes and etc cetera, etc cetera. Which is, I should say, you know, that 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 trope still very much exists in the present. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things I love to point out is that Firefly, uh, the 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 Joss Whedon sure. television show, yep. um, our hero Mal is modeled after like a classical Western yes. hero. And he specifically was a veteran in like a civil war like conflict in which he fought for like I think it's referred it's like a, a Confederacy. Like yes. a yeah. And it's all, you know, deracinated and attenuated from its source, but the trope of the this is an accepted dr dramatic archetype, right? That right. works a storytelling well, then, shorthand, right? 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 Because exactly. of how we've been conditioned to accept these characters within the larger sort of narrative well, construction of it, our history. It's Firefly it's, has so much of that going because there's that character called Jubal Early, like yeah. literally, it like starts borrowing names from the time. That's sort of interesting. Just to put a, 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 a pin on this, yeah. like, there's a re there's a reason why the post war apologist mythology around the South was called the lost cause. Like it's, it's a romantic notion mm -hmm. um, of what 
what was lost in the defeat of the in the defeat of the South. It's like obviously a false notion, but like it's all it's it's all so like it's just like in the culture. It's just part of very much in the culture of the 1920s. And so it's like it, it to me it, to me it's there's no mystery as to why Buster Keaton would have been fascinated by this stuff because like a lot of Americans were and it it would continue to go on to shape so much of our 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 visual mythology, right? Like the entire genre of the western. Mm-hmm. Not only not only is the entire genre of the western built on this, but then like all the inversions and subversions of the western are commenting on it as well. It's sort of right. like it's just like that's the thing. Like, all yeah. these advancements in sort of film language were often used for semi-fascist purposes and sort of, like, using it to really define an iconography, a, a sort of a cultural legacy, a sense of a history through this, like, incredible, just, like, brainwormy populist medium that really can take hold of people's imaginations right. and emotions. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so the general is about <laughs> so the general. Uh, yeah, it's about a uh, young uh, train engineer who runs mm-hmm. a locomotive called the General, which he loves very much. Right. It's a real locomotive. It still exists. You can go see it. It's a nice looking train. We already discussed that. It is a pretty, pretty nice looking sexy looking train. train. Are they expensive? Like what you what you want to like buy it? I mean, like, I just think it would be cool to have your own steam engine train. I think that it would be quite expensive to buy it. Yeah. More expensive to move it to, sure. to get it to you it's too and bad then, uh, patreon got rid of stretch goals and tears because we could have set it at we, two million subscribers we will buy the general yes uh, which is currently stationed i think in georgia or something um okay. most of this movie was shot in oregon this right? movie was shot in oregon because yeah. he went to the original locations in georgia near chattanooga mm-hmm. and he said it just didn't look good uh the railroad tracks he didn't like the look of the scenery was bad mm-hmm. Portland, apparently, or Oregon in general, covered in railroads, narrow-gauge railroads that he wanted to use because of all their lumber mills at the time. Uh, so that's why he picked it. They, you know, shot all over Oregon. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had a lot of trains available to them. He wanted to use the actual general. Yes. Uh, his requests were denied because they were like, we don't want to put this, like, war artifact into a comedy. Right. <laughs> um, so everyone was like on edge break. about him doing this. Yes. Understandably, uh, the gun, however, that they use is an actual gun from the Civil War. It's the first railroad gun, according to uh, Buster Keaton. Right, which he he found in his research yes. and almost excluded it from the movie because he was like, people will think this is a, a Buster Keaton invention. Right. For the sake of a gag, it um, feels anachronistic, but it is actually real. Uh, and then, uh, so yes, and it's, you know, it's about this railroad man. Uh, he loves Annabelle Lee and he loves right. the general. Uh, the Civil War has broken out. Right. Usually. And so the plot begins. In the Buster movie, he has a romantic rival who's a big guy who's fighting for the attention of the woman. Right. In this. A Bluto. Right. In this, his Bluto is the war, basically. Right? Uh, well, and is the train, I suppose, as well. Well, The train is his ally, I guess. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it is, it's this idea of, like, uh, you have no honor if you are not fighting on the front lines. Right. Yes, yeah. yeah he yeah, is immediately absolutely. emasculated That's in her mean. eyes if he doesn't fight. Uh, yeah. He goes, he tries to enlist. They immediately decide you are more valuable, valuable to us as a railroad. Right, you run a train. That's right. An Why would we thing. take you out of the system? Right. We're going to need your support. Um, this great bit I already alluded to, where he then tries to get back in line as yeah. a bartender and take on a different character, but it doesn't fly. And then you set up this sort of like central misunderstanding. I will say, versus a lot of these other movies we've covered, this movie sets up its plot really quickly. Yes. Uh, it gets to the point pretty fucking fast. Um, but uh, Buster also has long hair. Yes. Very iconic, obviously. Yeah. Sort of what I thought Buster Keaton looked like, but it's really just in this movie. It's that just he has this, this one. haircut. Yes. yes. But so much of the, the Buster Keaton iconography comes from this film. Him on the train. Yes. Um, but there's this sort of, he's too ashamed to admit that he was rejected, right. which her father and brother interpret as him uh, being lily livered. Right. A the, great term. Her, her brother says he didn't even get in line. Correct. Yeah. Um, and then you create the central uh, uh, misunderstanding in which she doesn't want to speak to him again because she thinks he's a coward because he's too embarrassed to tell her that he was turned away. 
And he's got this chip on his shoulder of wishing he would someday find the way, the opportunity, the opening to prove himself as a value to the South. And I'll say, I'll say just as, as, as we keep on going on with the plot, I'll say real yeah. quick that even this characterization of, you know, the, the, the card says Fort Sumter has been fired upon. Notice right. the passive voice. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> very New York Times. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, you work for the Times. Got that for something. <laughs> no, I'm trying to headline Damn, it. I'm trying to headline it. Bleeped now. a lot in this. I'm trying to headline David. it now. Uh, uh, yes, yes. For uh, in the <laughs> south, a, a, in the south, a fort is fired. A, a upon. fort fired upon. Yeah, sure. a fort fired sure. upon. Um, but like everyone immediately is like, I gotta go enlist, and that yeah. like it really is speaking to like you know this was these were honorable people. These yes. were. Um, uh, brave and courageous people, and yes. so it's really kind of playing in to um the the cultural message that we want to send about like our our defeated yeah um our defeated fo- fellow citizens here. And I, I do think there's something interesting to the fact that like b- because of Buster's physical type, right? It would be very easy to have the setup of this movie be he's flat footed, right? He has a weak disposition. He is being rejected from the military because he does not have the physical constitution for it or the makeup, right? But instead it is like you have a value in society. You actually are of greater value to us doing the thing you do that you think makes you look like less of a man, right? And that you are afraid makes you look like less of a man to the woman that you love versus you have been deemed less of a man right? Right. by us. There's something there um, yeah. that's kind of interesting. And I think how much Buster movies are always about, like, um, you know, uh, modernism versus tradition and also just about uh, uh, perceptions on different roles of masculinity in society and him sort of pushing back against them or feeling like they're pushing back against him. Um, so uh, the year passes, right? We we jump ahead in time. Yes, she finds right, out her right. dad's been wounded. Yes, uh, and she travels north to go see him with the general pulling the train. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's when the Union spies come to steal the train, right? Like, yes. that's when the action really kicks off. She, by the way, being played by Marion Mack. Mm-hmm. Uh, Buster wanted an old-fashioned girl with curly hair mm-hmm. uh, to have that sort of, you know, Civil War era look. Uh, Marion Mack was a bathing beauty, mm-hmm. you know, about bathing beauties. But there were these women who wore bathing suits on camera yes. t- to look beautiful. Yeah. And swim around. Not that different from Instagram models. No. Uh, yeah. I just like the word <laughs> bathing beauty. Oh, I love it. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, as you said, sure, she, the actress thought Buster was like sort of standoffish and weird, yes. but realized he was just kind of shy. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so exactly. There's right, so, this yeah. odd story. Buster liked pranking people a lot, the George Clooney of his day. Uh, yeah. And she had gone through hair and makeup and got all made up. And then Buster did some prank where he had some of the other cast pick her up and hold her upside down and it messed up her makeup. And he, like, because they had not bonded, he was so professional and sort of standoffish with her. Right. She didn't take it as, like, funny jabbing. So she went up to him and she punched him straight in the face. punched him in the eye. Got him a black eye. He couldn't film for a week. Yes. He and, had a shiner. But it also sounds like so it she really kind of... Oh, she really punched him straight in the fucking face. <laughs> yeah. But it also sounds like that kind of broke the tension between the right. two of them, where right. then suddenly it was like, oh, we're equals. And it is this thing I like about the movie that she's like in it with him from the second half yes, of the film. Yes, that is true. Right. They are, they are really partners throughout right. the film. It feels like much. he gives her more um, uh, agency in those scenes than he often does his female characters. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so, yeah, so the Union steals the... They want to steal the train. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so Johnny, our hero, Buster Keaton, mm-hmm. uh, chases after them. He gets on a bike. Yeah. A bone shaker. Uh huh. Always funny. Incredible name for anything. True. But it's funny that this was called a bone shaker. It looks like a bone shaker. Yeah. A big, uh, a big, big wheel bike. We watched this one uh, with, the, with the boy, and he thought mm-hmm. this was all very funny. It is very funny. He, he, he cracked up. Um, big time. He also he gets like a hand car at one right. point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Those are also funny. Those should come back. Those are always Absolutely. funny yes. and seem like it would just be a way to get around. Like, if, like a you know a, an alternative way to I guess commute. they don't really exist anymore. That is sad. No. I I wanna I wanna take my bone shaker or my fucking 
hand cart around Brooklyn, you know? Yeah, like, there's decommissioned rail lines, you know this. Yeah, and you People can, should be fun. able to I think, get their own hand No, cart. I just want to do it in the bicycle lane. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, Ben, I'm looking over at Ben, and on his computer screen, he just has a picture of a train. I swear he just has a <laughs> oh, window I found, open. there's steamlocomotive.com. There's, there's damn there's trains, trains for available. Sale? But I basically, sale? I was just looking, and it basically looks like a GeoCities page, where it's just a black screen and it's a just full like image of Rotating. No, just one train. <laughs> just train. Ben just had a picture of a train. How much is a train, Ben? Uh, they don't list the price. You uh, gotta negotiate. Okay. So you start um, at like $10 and see mm -hmm. what happens. Work your way up from there. Right. This is this thing. Uh, uh, we're talking to Jamal about like the, the weird, uh, how, how Buster can cut through to a kid really easily, right? Right. There's something to just how small he is. We talk about, like, his perception of the world is very similar to a child, so they can relate to him. But it's also just, like, he positions himself against larger people, against large vehicles, against technology in a way that just, like, I think cuts through to a kid where they're like, well, this is how I feel right, this is in my the world perception around me. Of the I don't world, have yeah. control. Yeah, 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 Everything's yeah, sort guy. of out to get me. To it's so, it's, I guess it's so interesting it, it, especially as we're living through an era where it's very difficult to get male action stars yes. to like show any kind of physical vulnerability yes. on screen, right? Like not even like emotional vulnerability, but like I am threatened by the things that are arrayed against me or they overshadow me or they're bigger than me in some right. way, shape or form. Which like Cruz has gotten really good at baking vulnerability into his action sequences, but he still isn't totally willing to let him look as small as he is on screen. Right, right. He's gotten better at it. Like he'll put yeah. Henry Cavill next to him. Yeah, he will. Occasionally. He'll look small. He will. He will. But and he'll look scared, which I feel like That's some people won't thing. really do. But like, he's really but started like, owning looking scared, being in over his head. But like a, a sure. Keaton-esque approach would have been for Cavill to loom over him. That's right. the thing. Right. You yes. watch any Keaton movie, and he never lets you forget how small he is relative to everything else. And he's actually going out of his way to cast the biggest people he can around him, to create the biggest set pieces around him. Everything is putting him in a context physically. Right. Which is, is so huge. And like Jackie Chan is another example of like, he was never the tallest guy, the buffest guy, the, you know, the strongest guy, any of that. And he frames it as such. Yeah. Um, for sure. Um, but this movie structurally is, is sort of like, I mean, we said unstoppable, but it's also got sort of the Fury Road thing where you're like, so basically, yeah, it just, from right. this it just moment, keeps moving. Yeah, it's right. like a 30 to 40 minute uh, uh, chase set piece. And then yes. you have this brief kind of reprise where we set up the plot stakes for the second half of the movie. And then the second half of the movie is another extended chase. Right. Sequence. The yeah. first chase is that he gets on this train called the Texas. Yes. And he's trying to bring soldiers with him, right? Yes. After the train. Right. Forgets that they're not tied. Whatever. He's just yes. driving a locomotive by himself. Yes. And so he has to figure it out all by himself. Uh, and then you have the big chase of the, the union trying to like shake him off and, right. and like they're doing trying crazy to stuff. intercept the delivery of supplies. Um, yes. Um, Anytime we cut to the union, they are all like so like snidely whiplash, sort of like maniacally evil. You know, yeah. it, it it is it's kind of wild how. Uh, ex explicitly sinister. They just seem like a bunch of assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, sort of similar to how they are in like Gone with the Wind and other movies about the South that I think about, right? They're brutes. Yeah. Right. They're invaders. They're like uncouth yeah, often, right. you know. I like, mean, and think about, I, I, not, to, not to do this too much, but like think about how up until quite recently, like what was the the standard narrative on how the North won the Civil War was not that they didn't have superior generalship sure. or superior soldiers. It was like a brute force win. Right. We just have right. more people and more armaments and more supplies, and we can just wear you down. They were kind Grant, of tougher in a way that was viewed as callous. Right. Sure. Grant is the butcher, right? right. Just like right. throws people to the slaughter. Right. Whereas the you know, Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. These were and, tacticians. Yeah. These right. were, yeah, these were, exactly. these were gal underdogs. It, it was, it was were, a romantic loss. Right. Versus yep. a sort of like ignoble victory. Right. Now, in reality, none of this is true whatsoever, no, right? But like, <laughs> but like part of like, I mean, we, it is true that it was a horrible grinding war, right? Yes, right. on both sides. On both sides, right? Like right, Lee, yeah. Lee, Lee was a decent tactician with terrible strategic sense, <laughs> yeah. so would like throw people into the grinder, right. yeah, and not worry about the supply lines. Grant, 
that I think that too many people don't know was like actually sort of like a a uh, a genius about thinking about movement and supplies and like yeah. so much of the success of his armies was actually less about throwing people into the grinder and more about like exhausting his enemy's supply lines right. and yeah. then like going in for the kill because it's like the first industrial war right it's right. like all this stuff is getting figured out like right. how to do all of that right yeah how to move quickly how to yeah. like how to how you to, have railroads how right. to use them right things like that um. But that's in, in in terms of cultural memory. It's mm-hmm. like yeah, the union. They're they're a bunch of snidely whiplashes because like yeah, they're just like they they don't they have no honor. They're right. they're gonna they're gonna win, but it's gonna be without honor, and the South will lose, but it will be an honorable loss. Yes. Uh, now relating this again to Fury Road, right? There's that thing that makes Fury Road so like incredible in its uh, construction and its craft. When you look at behind the scenes footage. You watch like B roll from the set, and you're like, "Oh, for most of that movie, the cars were stationary, right?" When you watch like behind the scenes footage of that movie, it's George Miller yelling at a parked car in the right. middle of the desert, and they're just blowing a lot right. of wind on them, and they're acting with the intensity of like we're moving at a really fast speed. But most of the time, unless it's a super wide shot, why, they were. Why bother not. moving them? What like, is you know? What is so astonishing for this movie, in this movie, and I think it's so much of why it gets this reputation as, like, Keaton's ultimate technical accomplishment, is he is always filming this in a way where you have the perspective of how quickly the background is moving behind him, how much the vehicles are constantly actually moving forward in real time that makes this movie just mind-boggling where you're like, how do you do multiple takes of this? How do you get yeah. one that works? How are you filming it at these speeds? What are these rigs you had? Where are the camera? Where's the camera mounted? You know, like all this shit. He's constantly just kind of showing you that he's not doing any trickery. And there is the the stunt in this movie, the gag that I feel like is most infamous quietly as just like, this feels impossible. There, were, like, how is there no trickery to this? Which is when they're trying to derail the train and they're placing yeah. the rail ties in the yeah. middle of the track. There's the one coming up. He gets off the train, runs ahead to try to grab it. The train comes up behind him. The grill of the train basically just functions like as a catcher. seat. A cow catcher. Best word in the world. Ca- okay. Yes, okay. yeah, the girl of the train. Yep. Right. And it's like without looking behind him, suddenly he lands perfectly on the cow catcher. He's holding onto this tie. The he iconic sees image. Another right. tie coming ahead. All this is happening in one shot. And then he throws it. Mounted on the back of some other vehicle ahead of them on the train, right? right. He sees the ta- tie. He's holding this thing that's larger than him. He throws it at just the right moment. It perfectly springs off of the track and it's fine. And everyone around him was like, you cannot do this shot. If you miss it by a centimeter or the physics of the throw right. actually push the tie further ahead in the track instead of off the track, the train derails. Right. You, you could, die. You could kill yourself. You could, right. you know, get killed by lose, these wooden beams or the train. And we lose the fucking train. Right. Yeah, yeah, The yeah, most yeah. expensive thing in this movie. And you watch it and you're just like, how did he get one take of it working this perfectly? And it feels like a mere, like the... The geometry of the arc of the throw of the tie and the way the other one springs up with like a perfect curve is just astonishing. Um, yes. I mean, I guess the most famous shot in this movie is the bridge collapsing because that became just like right. the most famous like shot in cinema history in a weird way. And also was just like, this is the most expensive shot. Right. Like, how was this done? This right. is crazy. But like, I do think him throwing that railroad tie is the most sort of like quietly astonishing stunt. Yes. Yes, that he did. Now, my thing with this movie, uh, like, uh, uh, on top of the political stuff, right, that we're we're talking about, is I do think this is, like, the least funny of his features. Yeah, sure. And it's almost by design. It's more thrilling than funny. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you don't, right, like, Buster is also less of a sort of uh, stinker isn't the word but what his persona is a little different in it i guess because he really is like a lovable underdog yeah, yeah. he's a lovable under- underdog there's a sense of desperation yes. in his persona yes. there's right? so like, much just like shit to deal with right and the stakes are quite high yeah like there's so much crap on but the track i'm like this is like this really is kind of like the the ethan hunt template right <laughs> right, right. I, you know i the entire time we've been talking i've just been thinking about mission impossible right. as sort of like this is this is the structure of like a, a, a final Mission Impossible sequence. The whole world's the whole, at stake. He's right. got to save everybody. Right. And the things keep on piling up against him. And he is very like, 
high functioning. He is very capable. He does keep on figuring it out, and it doesn't feel like it's by accident. Right. He's not really doing that thing that he does sometimes that Jackie Chan does or whatever. Right. It's like, oh, by mistake, I have defeated I accidentally a room of knocked enemies. Everybody out. Right. The, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the, layer, the layering of obstacles in an almost sort of yeah. like puzzly way feels very Brad Bird as well. Yes. yes. Like just sort of every 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 time he makes a gain there's a reaction right. that he now has to overcome because it's like it's not exactly a high octane movie because often the train is moving slowly yes and often they even stop it like they can stop the train sure. it does have brakes like it's not unstoppable for example no. it's a movie about a train <laughs> that cannot stop uh, a train the size of the chrysler building it is the size of the chrysler building but but the fact that as the general's owner once said um the fact uh, that the train is, by and large, moving creates yes. this tension and these stakes, and the set pieces are so clearly designed with your understanding of what the stakes are and what the conflicts are that it builds tension so well that when it does go for a joke, the jokes hit really hard because it's built up so much tension that is being the, released the one I think by the comedy. is like when he's off the train yeah. and it goes around a bend and he's like, fine, I'll cut across down this hill to catch up with it. But then Annabelle like reverses the train before he, you know, like, you know, all yeah. stuff like that, which is very funny. But you're also just stressed out. You're like, oh, my God, he's working so hard to get back on this fucking train. There's also that moment right before the union guys start throwing the ties onto yeah. the tracks where he's like just he feels like he made it out alive and everything's OK. And then there's a great moment of like Buster using the flat pan, his his punum where he just sort of, like, has a moment of relaxation, and then you see on his face him being like, wait, what the fuck just happened? Yeah, right. And then he starts looking at his surroundings and realizing, like, I lost that, I lost that. Everything's, like, fucking scattered to the wind. Um, it, it's, all of that uh, works really well, but he also talked about, like, I think this was so much of a challenge for him where he was, like, the audience is moving past a sort of, like, crazy gag-heavy comedy. I need to make something that's a little bit more of a drama and I want to challenge myself epic. to be able to go seven minutes without a joke yeah, and yeah. keep people invested in what's going on and present myself as a different type of leading man that can carry a different type of story. Um, and, you know, they had a lot of insane logistics to making it. Obviously you can read about a lot of all the sort of crazy production stuff. We don't have to go through it all. The like night scene when they were like getting poured rain on them, like this sort of, the sort of interlude scene where between the two train chases where he unites with her again, they almost like got pneumonia because they were just like, you know, being doused like day after day or night after night. Mm -hmm. um, so that was actually, it was actually raining. Right. I mean, okay. whatever, like they were using, they were pouring water all over them. Okay. All right. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, um, I'm trying to, you know, there's obviously the major thing is like, there's no back projection. Obviously. Right. So right. like every, anytime anything is moving, it's moving. And and, and he's framing it, it to remind you. Yeah. Right. He doesn't want you to lose track of it. Yeah. Um so yeah. So how you know, how does he do the uh the rail tie gag? I don't know. He just like worked he just, he did, just it. did it. Yeah. That's the thing. With all these, it's just like he just did it. Um the, you know, the reason the the bridge collapsing collapsing is so famous is because he refused to use models. Yeah, that cost like forty grand or something. Yes. That was like the most famous shot ever. Right. I mean the most expensive shot of the time. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the whole thing with a water spout, that's like a crazy gag. He'd already yes. like hurt himself once with a water spout gag. On Sherlock Jr. where he right. breaks his neck. He breaks his neck and yes. never realizes it. Um, he like fractured his neck. He's fine. <laughs> Tough it up, Buster. <laughs> yeah, Buster King should toughen up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think like that was logistically crazy because like the way that works where they like have to misalign it and yeah. then they miss it and then they swing it. And well, that's then, the thing. You know. It's like it's, it's hard to reset a take on uh, railroad Road tracks. Dreams, right. You know, it's not easy to just be like, well, let's back it up to one. Yes. Um, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. What else? What else? What else? Do you guys I mean, like you, ha you have this, uh, the midsection where he breaks into the house to look for food and ends up realizing. There's a surprise attack, like, that he has to warn them about. Well, he's, yeah. he's the spy underneath the table. Yes. Annabelle catches them there. In, They've right. kidnapped uh, his love interest, Annabelle. Annabelle. And that's like suddenly he has all the information for the second half of the movie to understand how to get ahead of everybody, prove his worth. Yeah. yeah. And then, I mean, and then from there, it really does, it just doesn't stop until the movie ends. It's right. sort yeah, of just it's get a, the general yeah. go over, line, over the lines. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it is, I don't know. I think this movie's great. I get it. 
Yeah, it's, I like others of his movies more. Yeah, this is but the But it's thing. such an, a profound technical accomplishment right. or whatever. You I know, like, all that stuff. I tend to like, in my personal ranking of just preference and taste. And we will do a personal ranking. We will get there. Movies. But I'm like, this tends to be dead center of the list for me. Mm. Just because it it's it embodies less of what I like about the Buster Keaton comedies. Even if I do think it's probably the crowning achievement of his career just as a filmmaker. Right. Yeah. And it was regarded as such. Yes. As Again. a technical artist. Yes. Yeah. I mean, much, much, much in the same way that um, the closing fight of Battling Butler is sort of this real kind of enduring class and how to shoot a fight and make yeah. it compelling. I do think that what is so remarkable about this movie almost a hundred years later is how you can kind of see like the basic principles of action yes. filmmaking, yes. like being worked out yeah. and still entirely apply. Like right. if you want, if you, if you are a, a budding filmmaker who wants to make action films, you can watch this movie and draw real lessons about like, this is how I should structure my film. And that's why I think it's canonized as his masterpiece is because like you can check in with this movie every 10 years and be like, the influence of this is still profound. It's immediate. If you not, see I mean, it. The thing with fucking John Wick and Ethan Hunt right now is right. like, you can feel it more than ever right yes. now. Yeah. Because like those movies sort of are trying to strip away personality and Not people that those are characters like don't have yelling like can we please get back to this yeah i mean uh, that, yeah. that's the whole conceit of the new mission impossibles really yeah. is that like look at tom cruise do a a stunt an impossible yes. thing an impossible thing in for which there seems to be no edifice there he's exactly. just right. he's just doing a thing it, it and, actually and, happened and the john wick movies are in you know, especially the sequels uh, are like, he can't stop moving. There's right. constantly right. a new threat. There's something chasing him. He has to keep on figuring out his way around the new circumstances. And Keanu is so smart about like, I, I the longer this movie goes on, I will play the wear and tear of everything I've been up against. So you're constantly feeling the stress of, he's now limping he's through tired. this. He's hurt. He's yeah. tired. But like John Wick 2 opens with a fucking shot of Buster Keaton. Yeah, it's the shot of that yeah. movie is Buster Keaton being projected against a wall. Chad Sahelski is very like uh, you know yes. uh, vocal about his right. ad adoration, and for, it's also yeah. like uh, you know uh, uh, Jackass is so tied to this as well. I, 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 has talked about yeah. that a lot. Where it's totally. the same thing of just like just place a camera down and watch people do shit for real, and right. you build up the tension. You don't know how it's going to go, and it's funny if it goes well, and it's funny if it goes poorly. Are they yeah. going to do another one? I don't know. He almost like killed himself in the last one, right? So maybe I not. think he's been very clear that like, I'm not going to do much anymore. Yeah, he's out of the game, and yeah. and that's why they added so many young people for four. Right. I have to imagine they'll do some next Probably generation something. thing. But I mean, we Jen and I saw we went to that Jackass marathon where he did the Q and A afterwards, and he was very much like everyone in my life has told me this is the last go around. Sure, and there were like ten bits he had planned after the bullfight shot for jackass forever that yeah. his doctors were like you cannot do another one no 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 right. no yes well right. they were just like your picture yeah, no, wrapped. Sure, sure. Yeah, this right, that was right. your last jackass on ever you do one more you die right um so this movie was very expensive to make the general yes uh which was part of that was part of the, the other thing i don't know if you know about this but uh, Buster Keaton was also making a house, building a house for himself and his wife uh -huh. that was also extraordinarily expensive. I think it cost $300,000 to make it. And if which I've learned in anything, 1926 is a lot of money. If I've learned anything from watching Buster Keaton's work, it's that he's not terribly good at constructing a house he's for his wife. He's very bad at making houses. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things well. he's almost comedically bad at. No, I would say $300,000 in today's dollars is probably going to be something close to like $3.5 million. Right. More, like, I would think of it as, yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, but of this course, was seen as like an absurd extravagance at the time. It, they were worried. They were like, Buster, you're going over your head. Right. on this place and then he divorces his wife and she gets the house yeah actually sort you know, of a I'm, classic buster Keaton. Scenario. i'm wrong it's closer to like uh it's closer to like five million dollars it's a lot of money hey. buster yeah, yeah. uh the and general also so itself much of this is like 750 it's grand which taking is so long yes um he screens the movie for people he shaves 30 minutes out of it the film mm -hmm. is quite long i would say it's for, 120 it's it's close an to? hour 15 maybe but like in mm -hmm. a pretty it feels like almost like yeah. a modern feature length movie more yes. than some of this stuff he made. Um, uh, the test screenings went great. Uh, it premiered in Tokyo, which is crazy. Yeah, isn't that wild? 
uh, that was not the initial plan. The initial plan had been to premiere it in New York, but um, uh, and because this was a United Artists film, MGM slash Metro starts shutting them out of theaters. You know, this is the old oh, pre Paramount yeah, yeah. ruling thing right. where like studios own theaters and can be like, you can't premiere at like the Capitol Theater yeah. in New York because so they we to own to it. Tokyo. So instead, they. Uh, release it in Tokyo, which is bizarre, and mm-hmm. then they start haphazardly rolling it ar- out around the country. Um, the big p- reason people don't like it is there is what you said, Griffin. They're just like, this isn't funny. This like, is countless. enough. Yeah, this is this is too dramatic. Yeah, I'm not laughing and rolling on the floor. I yeah. might be chuckling, but like, where is my Buster who makes me stick you know, to what roar you know. with laugh? Friend, you're right. like the movie right before this was just. Wouldn't it be funny to watch him box? It's so simple. And everyone's like, you don't need to complicate this anymore. Um, and there is some reviews that are like, this is in bad taste. Yes. Like that you would do this, of, you know, about the war. Not the Civil War specifically, yeah. but I think just like anything with like people dying. Yeah. Can I say I've been, uh, for these uh, for this series, watching, uh, splitting between, because I own basically the Buster catalog in like three different versions on physical media because you have so many differences in like which distributors have the better special features, which one has have the better restorations, the better soundtracks, whatever. But I was watching the the Kino version sure. for this, the yes. Kino, the more recent I Kino watched, release. Yes, yeah, the, yeah, the which uh, that, right? is the yeah. Lobster Film uh, uh, restorations. Yeah. I can't remember if it's an episode that's come out yet or not, but the two main camps of the Buster restorations are the Bologna restorations and the Bologna lobster. Bologna and lobster, yes. Bologna and lobster. Uh, but so I was watching the lobster restoration, which I think is not supposed to be as good as the Bologna, but the reason I want to watch the Kino version is because I noticed, and I had never watched the film this way despite seeing it several times, there is a score by, and I'm going to fuck up his name, but um, Miyazaki's composer. Joe Hisashi. Joe Hisashi wrote yes. a score for this he movie. Did. I've never listened to it. Is it good? Yeah, it's so good. Well, that guy is pretty good at his job. But it's interesting that the score is very serious. It is like mm. a stirring. It sounds like the score for The Wind Rises or something. Sure, sure. It sure. is a very dramatic score right. that is like, it, it's it's beautiful and it plays right. up the tension of the movie very well. But it makes it even less comedic, I would argue, than it already is. Uh, So watching it today, I was just like, man, this movie doesn't have a a lot of jokes in it. No, it's just very thrilling. Yes. Uh, And it's, yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, It... Obviously, it's just more sort of one of those classic cases, though, of like, yeah, rejected at the time or, you know, semi-rejected. Yeah. Uh, seen as a bit of a folly and then like slowly whatever discovered and celebrated he always defended it he always said it was the one he was most proud of this right this usually right. his flops he would be kind of negative about but well, this I is failed. the one he stuck right. up for I think he always felt like if, if the audience didn't like it then I failed um, right I work for them and this is the one he was like I do think that was the best I ever did as a director but um, it was in the top 10 of the sight and sound polls in the 70s and 80s like yeah. it was you know it was uh, very has recorded. Sherlock Junior surpassed it in the recent polls. I'm not sure. I can find that. Or is this still his highest rated film? I, I don't know. Well, I'm asking you to find out. Guys. I'm trying to say things to buffer as you look it up. Well, you're going to have to say something else. It's going to take Okay, me a here's second. what I'm going to say. Jamel, do you have any final thoughts on the general? Do I have Before any final thoughts on the general? Okay, so um, first of all, if you're going to show this to your kids, be sure to be prepared to explain what the Civil War was. Um, yep. I made the mistake of forgetting about all of that when I showed this to my kid, and then I had to explain in four-year-old words what the Civil War was. Tough. Although Tough. Although Sherlock I'll, Jr. is now number one. Okay. I'll say this. I'll say this for any parents listening, mm. and, and in the context of lots of stuff happening in the country, uh, I, w- I was able to explain to my kid what slavery was mm-hmm. and also to get him to understand that not only was it wrong, but the people at the time knew it was wrong. Mm-hmm. He could like totally grasp that. So... It's like... Jamel, that's impossible. All I've heard <laughs> it's on the news is it's not only impossible, but it's actually dangerous it's to dangerous tell kids the truth. to tell kids the truth about yeah. anything. Um, and it's selfish. Why would you do that? Why right, would I right. do why that? Why do you why feel the need to say the to thing that is true? Yes. Uh, no, I think this movie... Like I said, I think this movie is... I don't... I've not seen... I've not like... I have not I have not comprehensively seen every Buster Keaton mm-hmm, movie. Sure. But I think even if I if I do do that... This is going to be at the top for me because I do find it so thrilling and exciting. And yeah. although the Keaton comedies I've seen are a, lot, are a lot of fun, just for dispositionally for me, 
I like this kind of movie. Like, right. This mo- is the forebear to basically your favorite genre of film. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, I, I think it's, I think it's like a totally compelling watch. When I, I, you know, watched it last year, and then when I, I, I heated up on Sunday to watch it, I was just like immediately, I was like, I, I'm in for this for it's, this hour and fifteen minutes. Like, it's, I'm, it's a gripping watch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's play the box office game. Okay. Uh, I just want an honorable mention. The chain plays a big part in this. Yeah. Yeah. You also texted me a picture of a train, Ben. I texted the group just yeah, now. The, the, but the, that's, the there's there's more to this. Just a picture of a train. It's a tin type there's... of a train. You I, know, I going have, around uh, a circle. A uh, relative uh-huh. who was a early photographer. Oh, Mr. Hosley took this picture. Yeah. So really. Yeah, so his name is Harry Hugh Hosley. This is called Triple Steam H? Engine Coming Up the Hill at Keating where, Summit. Where's this photo displayed right now? It's uh, from 1904. You can see his work at the Eastman Museum. Is that where cool. this That's lives? That's really cool. Yeah. But but this photo you just sent us, is that it on display at the Eastman Museum? No, that's the copy that my dad has. Very cool. Mm. Yeah. Is it a tintype or is it just a straight photo? Did people call him Triple H or not? It probably would have been. They didn't. It probably would have been a tin type at that time. At that time, I believe so. Because when you're saying tin type, it's like uh, like the advancement of a daguerreotype. Right, right, right. Yes. So it's it's that that would have been that would have been the most affordable and easy format for taking a film because negative film of the kind that we know of doesn't show up in this kind of routine use for a little bit. Like a decade later, I do think I'm just we saying go cameraman's back. about a tin type photographer. It it's this is this is foreshadowing hey, for what's to we'll come. Talk about well, H I just because I knew Jamel was a, a camera, oh yeah, yeah. Buff, so I had to I had to brag. That's a cool ass photo. Um, I, I think it's good. Yeah, it rules. We'll I'm going to be in upstate New York at the end of the summer, and I, I'm going to have to make a make a trip to that the Eastman Museum. Yeah. I, well, it's I, really cool. I shot a movie in Rochester last fall, and that museum uh, fucking rules. It's great. It's also cool how much that entire town is like it, it, it seeped in this history of photography. They, they have well, they have all these like sepia screenings or nitrates or whatever, yeah. right? Yes. Like it's all you know all that yes. stuff. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. Number one. The, 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 I said, come on, let's see the boxers came out. Um, oh, right, uh, come on, let's February, see the box office Feb- uh, February 1927. Okay. The general's opening at number five. Okay. Number one is um, a n- famous hit vehicle. No, okay, yeah. I, as I was digging into the research, I was reading the reviews of this movie that were critiquing it. We're like, why can't Buster take a lesson from the number one movie, the hit that everyone wants to see? Which is? And I was like, I'm going to have this unfair advantage where now I know this title because I read all these negative reviews of the general saying he should have okay. made it more like this film and I already forgot the name of it. It's called Blank and and Blank. Is the structure of this title Blank and no, Blank? I don't know what you're talking about, I, I must say. But then what the fuck am I talking about? I don't know what you're reading. But also, like, movie releases and number ones, it was so different back then. They were saying this movie had been number one for, like, months. What's the number one movie in America at this point? I am telling you that uh-huh. the number one is a massive star vehicle for one of the biggest stars of the time, Clara Bow. Okay. Clara Bow? I'm not actually sure. It's not It. It's It. It is It. Yes. The original It Girl. It. The exactly. term It Girl yes. exists because of this movie. In which oh, she plays shit. a character called Pennywise the Clown, <laughs> and she torments a group of young Maine children. This movie is called It, and yes. she was this hip modern woman, Yeah, and everyone was like, she's the It Girl. This is like the new yes. cool archetype in pop culture, and so that the next moment that someone presents themselves as like the new Clara Bow, they became the new the it, it Girl. Girl. Yes. That's... Really interesting. Uh, Because it didn't come up in the New York mag feature at all. Oh, what? They just did a whole thing about it, girls. It doesn't matter. Uh, It's really good. Yes, I read it. I read it. I read it. Um, Yes. Uh, Clara Bow's It Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, yeah, and like um, Bill Hader's in it and uh, fucking Jessica Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Chastain. Uh, uh, You know, a lot of jokes I could make here. Um, But uh, Clara Bow, obviously. Margot Robbie's character in Babylon, very obviously inspired by sure. Clarabo. Yes. Um, so Clarabo is ruling the box office. Now, number two is a great rival of Buster Keaton's. Is uh, it a Chaplin or a Lloyd? It's a Lloyd, a Harold Lloyd film considered one of his best. Speedy? No. Safety last. No. That's a great one, obviously. The Freshman came up in another box yes. office game. I don't so know, know this movie. That. It's got a good okay. poster. He's sort of hanging from a trapeze. Interesting. 
Uh, and he looks, and maybe it's not a, because this looks like it's a Western, but he's hanging from some it's kind of. It's not Grandma's Boy, is it? No, it's not Grandma's Boy. It's called The Kid Brother. Oh, I've never seen it. Uh, you know, uh, it's a Western with Good title. Yeah, yeah, pretty good title. Uh, sounds like he's some kind of kid brother in it. Yeah. All right. Number three is another title I know very well. It's a Raul Walsh film. Uh, I think it's been made, I think it was made into a uh, talkie in the 50s. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Is this Flesh and the Devil? No. Is that in the top five? It is in the top five the week before. Okay, that is the movie I saw coming up in the reviews of this. That was number one, uh, not, it was in the top five the week before. Right, and I, what I got That's wrong That's a John is Gilbert film. They delayed Brad the release of this for several months they were because afraid Flesh, of Flesh and the, the Devil. Devil was like fucking E.T., just like owning the box office for months and months. Um, that is So maybe, I guess they finally released it as it started to drop off. Sure, that is maybe the most famous John Gilbert movie, that or sure. The Merry Widow or whatever. Um, no, this is a Raoul Walsh film. It is a war film. Interesting. Uh, it's uh, set during World War I. Mm-hmm. Uh, stars Edmund Lowe. And it's called... What's it called? Yeah. Hey, Guns Away. What Price Glory? Uh, another good title. Based I was going to guess play. Gold. Uh, it was. It's called Gold. Um, and then okay, number five at the box office mm-hmm. uh, is the general. Sorry, number four at the box office is a Lon Chaney film. Okay, Lon Chaney. Yeah, Lon Chaney. Yeah. What were you correcting? No, I just was checking to say it was Lawn. Is lawn name? Chaney, L O N. Not Lawn, like like a lawn mower. L O N. Okay, cool. Uh, lawn. Not really a movie. A movie so unknown that it does not have a Wikipedia page. Let's see if I can find any version of it. Um, but is it it's, called? Oh no, here it is. Is it called The Unknown? No, I I, I just was. I think I was dropping out something. Um, I think there is a lost Lawn Chaney film called The Unknown because I made a mistake in a previous episode that people always correct me where I attribute a different movie to be called okay. The Unknown. Well, I don't know anything I'll never about live that, this But down. it's a Lon Chaney film. It's another World War One movie. What okay. do you think? It's called... Or it's a war movie. It's Guns Away! It's called Tell It to the Marines. Hmm? Kind of an intense title. Yeah. A silent film about a Marine also, recruit and the sergeant what who to trains movie him. Title? Well, you know what? They're telling you. Um, so those are the top five. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you've also got a movie called Blonde or Brunette. We'll never know. A movie called Old Ironsides. Mm-hmm. Now that might be about um It's a Michael Ironside prequel. <laughs> well, I guess that's a it's about a boat, but you know, wasn't fucking we didn't we talk about someone who was called Old it doesn't matter. Uh Paradise for Two, McAdams Flats. Okay. Altars of Desire. Mm. There you go. Killer box office. Pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so that's that, and we are done uh, talking about these movies. Uh, but let's also say this this ends Buster Keaton's independence, basically, right? He's followed Skank over now to the, the studios, yeah. as Skank himself has moved over to the studios, and this is his big play within that ball game. And this movie is seen as such an out-of-control production as him sort of falling into self-indulgence, underperforms, and it's like the end of the line, Buster. You gotta, you gotta figure out how to play within the system now. You yes. gotta, you gotta play everyone else's game. Right. You gotta get more strategic and responsible about how you make these movies. Yeah. And that uh, leads to him going over to MGM. Yes, but not yet though. He has two more movies that he makes for UA, and then MGM. Yes. Yes. But this, this is. St- yeah, it's the beginning of the end. It's for the sure of the, end. of the independent productions. Yeah. Yes. Um, but no, next week we will talk about college, college and Steamboat Bill Jr. Yes. 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 Right. I like Steamboat Bill Jr. Steamboat Bill good. Jr. is good. Yeah. College is good or I've never seen college. College is the one that has, has the most blackface. Yes. Yes. I think I knew that. Yeah. So, you know, be prepared for that, uh, yeah. listeners, obviously, when it's, dealing with movies you know of this what's era. It's odd in watching uh, these films. Sometimes it will sneak up on you. Yes. Yes. And it's always uh, not fun. Yeah. Um, he will have gags that are based around the reveal of someone being black. He very often does this gag of like, uh, Steamboat Bill Jr. has one at the beginning where his father is waiting for him to arrive by a train and you see a guy who from behind looks like Buster Keaton and has the hat and then he turns around and the guy is black and the joke is clearly, well, this is a very easy way to communicate that it's not the right guy, right? And that is like played by an actual African-American actor. Yes. 
And then he will just have supporting roles occasionally played by someone in blackface right. in some of his movies to no narrative end, to no comedic end. But most of them are devoid of the thing that college has, which is like an extended sequence that is playing in menstruary. Right. Yeah. Should I? Maybe I should have been on that episode because I can, I can do a whole riff about... I mean, this is... Keaton is working in what might have been one of the most racist decades in American history. Yeah. Just like straight up. Because Just, it's pre-depression. It's post-World War One. America's kind of high on its own supply in a way. High on its own supply. It's sort of the it's the height of early imperial America. Right. It's, Business is booming. It's the right. height of American yes. nativism. We have the 1924 immigration bill that basically like ends immigration to the U.S. for the next 40 years. It's like there every every like every other week there's some new pogrom against black people in the country. It's like it is no exaggeration. Maybe the most racist decade in American history. Like the the Tulsa massacre is nineteen twenty. Tulsa massacre is nineteen twenty one. Rosewood massacre is nineteen twenty two. Discussed on the show. Um, this yeah. Ku Klux uh, yeah. Klan has a couple million members. Those it, it, is, it is the thing that is like you get on edge, right? When you see like an actor show up in blackface in one of these movies and then so often it is to no end whatsoever that is kind of a relief because you're bracing yourself for some like horrendous fucking joke. Yeah. But it makes it all the odder when it doesn't happen in a way. Uh, especially because he would then hire African-American actors in other parts. Yeah. Um, well, but we'll I, talk about I don't it. Know. Know. bad decade as you sure said. bad sure. decade yes 1920s suck it's always been when I was in high school you're never gonna see VH1 do I love the 20s uh, no, it was, no, no, no one liked the 20s. them but like there is a we, I don't know when, when I was in high school there like people like love doing you know great Gatsby themed you know sure stuff in college people did it too and I never really understood I was like this decade was bad, terrible bad like, time bad decade people were like depressed like people weren't like I think we're killing it and then in retrospect looking back on it in the moment, people were like, "This kind of sucks, right? Yeah. Like everything's kind of bad right now." I think I think a black historian at the, the we it's called sort of informally 1900 to this time the yeah. nadir of the African American experience, yeah. and I think that was coined in the 20s. Yeah, <laughs> we're calling it. We we're, don't need perspective. No yeah. hindsight necessary. We know what this is. We're in the worst pocket right now. I mean, the 30s are terrible too, but like the fashion's better, and there's Art Deco. <laughs> So, like, sure. you got that going for it? I mean, sure. There's yeah. a Democrat in the yeah, White yeah, House. Yeah, 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 yeah you got all Frankie stuff. D. Yeah, you know, he's, he's tearing shit up. Yeah. All right. We're done. I got to pee. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, Jamel, thank you so much for once again gracing us with your time and your thoughts. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, pleasure is always ours. Uh, people should uh, just keep up with everything you're doing. Oh, yeah. I guess I do have stuff to plug. Yes. But yeah, I mean, my column in the newsletter for the New York Times, but I, I have a podcast myself with my friend John Gans. Yes. It's called Unclear and Present Danger. It's about the political and military thrillers of the 1990s and what they say about the politics of that decade. Basically, watch movies like The Fugitive mm -hmm. and then talk about their politics and cultural relevance. Our most recent episode, as of this recording is on it's not on, we just we just we just we, we just watched true lies so we haven't recorded that yet okay but this what is, is coming it? out in two weeks this episode basically uh yeah this episode is coming out uh may 28th yeah I, I i went through my spiel and then i did neglected to see what was the last thing we did uh -huh. Um, it, it, hey, I can't relate. It's only a thing that we do basically every episode. But you guys are in the mid nineties now. Yeah, basically. we're in the mid nineties. You're moving sort of chronologically. We're moving chronologically. Our last movie was Canadian Bacon. Oh my oh. god, that movie's so weird. Yeah, so, so weird. good conversation. Uh, but that's 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 the podcast. So you should listen to it. We have a Patreon where we, where we do we we do Cold War stuff. So mm. we're we're doing some highbrow uh, Costa Gavras thrillers. Oh yeah, do this. Um, Zed. Yeah. Yeah. What? Uh, I'm sorry. What movie? Z. Z. Oh, you mean Z? Z. <laughs> Z. Aluminium. Yeah. Uh, I I take I take no side in uh, the pronunciation wars. Yes. Yes. The the true most tragic wars. <laughs> Gif. Brother Gif. against brother. Yes. Syllable against syllable. No winners. Uh, innocence lost. Um. But everyone, yes, should should uh, should listen on Clear and Present Danger. And thank you all for listening to this. Yeah, um, you should go to the general and save some time. 
or how does the jingle go for a great low ben, rate? I really you can get have online, to pee. Go to the general. Ben, and save some stop time. doing an insurance ad on my <laughs> podcast right now. You're telling Rosario Dawson's vagina can save right. me time. You know what? I'm just gonna <laughs> pee. I'm just gonna do it. That's fine. Go. It feels like it would take time. Uh, thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you to Go to the Barty. general. Save some time. Yeah, yeah. For our social media and helping to produce the show. Thank you to AJ McKee and Alex Barron for our editing. Uh, Pat Reynolds, Joe Bowen for our artwork, Lane Montgomery and the Great American Novel for our theme song, J.J. Birch for our uh, research. Tune in next week for, as we said, uh, uh, College and Steamboat Bill uh, Jr. Over on Patreon. You got the schedule up, Ben? Yeah, coming up on Patreon. We're getting close to the end of our run of the original Planet of the Apes. Uh, on June 1st is Conquest. My favorite. That the movie of the apes. rules. That movie is unbelievable. So hard. Yes. It is so thrilling yes. and captivating. Yeah. Oh, God, I love that movie. I'll just say this. I, I think it is dead to rights the best Planet of the Apes movie. It's not even close for me. If you're watching the director's cut, which you have to watch, uh, David starts the episode and is like, this is some stupid fucking Griffin contrarian take. And about an hour in, he's like, I, I think you might be right. Because people, they're like, if that was that good, then how is its reputation not better than the original? And that's my question, because everyone should fucking watch this. And thing. I have this right. Conquest is the fourth one. Correct. Right, yeah. Yeah. Though no, it's... It, man. Roddy McDowell gives one of the most incredible performances of that decade. That, I, I, I you know, I remember I watched that. Because I bought the box set and Same. just was making my way through. And I was just like, what's this one? No one ever talks about the fourth. And thing. I really like the third one. But the third yeah. one's funny because it's like this sort of almost like slice of life comedy. And yes. then it gets super bleak at the right. end. But Four the, is unrelentingly bleak beginning to end. And like it's the, the some of the shots during the ape uprising are just so evocative. Yes. It's like it's like everyone involved in that movie is like we have no money. Yes. We have, we have no resources. We're still going to do literally as much as we possibly can. It is one of the most astounding uh, uh, resources versus impact movies. Yeah. Uh, even if you are not signed up for our Patreon, I highly recommend just watching yeah. it. It's a film I endorse as much as almost any movie. Apes, Ape series, pound for pound, best sci-fi franchise hard agree it's the reason i i have wanted two years for talk about them and that's what we're doing now over on patreon and by the way as as we try to remind people uh we unlock every patreon episode after two years so right now uh the the early 2021 stuff is being unlocked and patreon has its new free membership program if you want to sign up for that you'll get the notifications when those episodes become unlocked uh, you can listen to them in the Patreon browser or download the Patreon app. And at some point in the future, there will also be the ability to get a private RSS feed for the free membership. Yeah. I presented that right? You did. That was all right. Fantastic. Yeah, you could, uh, you could listen along uh, to us watch Toy Story. Yeah, that's what's happening right now. I'm very... Another deep... I'm very Griffin. normal in those episodes. Yeah. Very low key. There's no reason why I would be super amped up March and April 2020. Or no, no, this is 20. Yes, right? It's 2020. So it's three years we unlock them. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. that's what it is. I'm sorry. I was wrong before. But yes, eh, you know, early lockdown, me going insane uh, talking about the Toy Story movies. Uh, and you can find links to that and all other sorts of nerdy shit at blankcheckpod.com. And as always, David's gone. David just left. David just straight well, he up. said he had a thing. But I am, I'm just, I'm reporting the facts. That's true. That's true.